Rated. You've got turbo, you've got big looking cars like the Emil Frey Jaguar and the Bentley, you've got the rather more stubby shapes of BMW Z4s, the Nissan that seems to tower over anything else, you've got the svelte Lamborghini on the front row, Ferraris are plenty, the Audi R8s that seem to be metronomically successful but astonishing, they haven't had an outright win in endurance this year, so all these different types of car on the grid and we are just about ready to go then. The grid is about to be cleared at the front with the green flag is Alain Adam, the series race director and on his instruction the cars will be waved away and that should be in five seconds time the pace car as it is the leading car is there with the lights atop and the green flag will be waved any second now to release the field and so then that final round of the Blancpain endurance series is but moments from getting underway Alain Adam Waves the flags, he releases the cars then, and it's going to be Mirko Bortolotti's Lamborghini, the Huracan, a new car for this year, the Dallara-inspired car. With GRT Grasser Racing Team looking after it, it takes a long time for the back of the grid to leave the line, and it'll take a long time for everyone to come pouring through at the end of this formation lap, the pace lap, to get the race underway. But there's so much to look forward to in this. We'll worry about the championship, I think, as the race calms down, assuming it does calm down because certainly to begin with, it's going to be about track position, it's going to be about the race itself, but then as drivers start to settle into a rhythm, their position relative to the class opposition is going to be fascinating to see. Everybody is away safely, although number 10, Ferrari, I think, has dropped towards the rear of the grid, so should that have been there? Yes, it was just slow away, so it was on the penultimate row anyway. Maurice Ricci's car gets away a little bit slowly, but it has got going, so everybody clear for this formation lap. We've had a look at the grid in terms of the cars, now have a look in terms of the drivers. Adrian Zaug and Katsuma Chio at the front. The second row is going to be Craig Dolby lining up alongside Alvaro Parent, the start driver I'll give you. The third row is Hubert Haupt alongside Max Book. The fourth row of the grid, Guy Smith and Harry Tinknell. And then on row five, you've got the Ferrari of Stephen Parov alongside Renat Salikov's green Renaldi racing Ferrari. The sixth row of the grid, Jean-Carl Vernet in Audi number one. That'll be a car to watch alongside 99, started by Nico Bastien. The next row, row seven, Greg Gilvers on the inside and Frank Stippler, championship leader in the Pro Cup with a lot of work to do from 14. 15th on the grid, Mauro Engel. Lining up alongside him is Stuart Leonard, the eponymous team owner of that Aston Martin squad. Row nine, Marco Bonanomi and Ryan Ratcliffe. Row 10, Marcus Winkelhock and Morgan Moulin Trafford. The 11th row, Peter Schotthorst, who went off in qualifying and brought out a red flag. He lines up alongside Stefan Mucker. He'll be one to watch in 44 Aston. Mike Parisi will start 84 Bentley, Rob Bell alongside in the McLaren number 58. Then the Jaguar, Freddie Barth at the wheel, alongside Duncan Cameron, the Pro-Am champion of the year. Henri Asid and Gilles Vanillet line up together on row 14. The 15th row is going to have Miguel Torrell's Mercedes, the similar car of Indy Dodger alongside. And has Stefan Mucker got a problem? Because the motorbase Aston Martin is trickling and has come to a halt in the middle of the Schumacher S on the formation lap, the motorbase car has a problem, it sets off now. Looked like it was one of those electrical gremlins where you have to reset things, but it's got going again now. Carrying on through the grid, Bradley Ellis and Pierre Giuseppe Perazzini line up on row 16, Vasiliev and Bronieski behind, then it's Anderson and Brito, Modell and Moore, Jimenez and Eret, De Mustier and Delina on row 21, row 22, Cocker and Bartos, the 23rd row, Hedman and Westwood, the 24th row, Constantino and Grutz, the 25th row, Kondakov and Earl, the 26th row, Carl Wendlinger and Christoph Amon, the 27th row, Pierre-Etienne Bourdais and Maurice Ricci, the last car on the grid driven by Christian Kelders, and everybody comes out of the chicane, all formed up, all ready to go. Take one deep breath as the last race of the year in the Endurance Series, John, is set to get underway. Yeah, it's V10. It's V10, horsepower versus V6, turbo torque, and, well, Gio, who's the lightest driver in the field, probably one of the smallest, may have a slight advantage, but really, it's going to be eyeball to eyeball in turn one. Here we go, lights out, the race underway. Mirko Bortolotti it is, who sprints away, is up the inside, tries to go Craig Dolby in the black and turquoise Nissan. Can he squeeze into the race lead? Yes, he can. Fantastic, Dolby leads. Up the inside goes the Mercedes of Hubert Haupt as well. To the outside line is Gio. There's contact between the two Bentleys that lead on each other. Harry Tignall gets forced out wide in his GT debut in the red, white and blue Nissan. The Jaguar has gone wide at turn one as well. But they sprint their way through the Mercedes arena for the first time. Stefan Mucker has got the Aston going strongly. He is looking to gain ground as the cars work their way through for the first time. The triple three Ferrari with Renat Salikov at the wheel tries to squeeze up the inside of number 59 McLaren. Alvaro Parent has fallen back over the first few corners as we accelerate then now down towards turns five and six for the first time. Oh, Lewin, it's just, oh, and all you can do is just hold position, hope for a gap and uh, let's get back to the lead because that was a blinding start by Craig Dolby on row two. 
to unaccelerate the pole position. And that was the pole position, uh, the, the Lamborghini there we see in view. And right now the Mercedes has got ahead of Chio as well. So great start from the Mercedes from that third row of the grid. Hubert Hout, the driver, who knows his way around here, hugely experienced driver, now on board with Quetzalmasa Chio as he works his way now up through the Schumacher S's. Lots of kerb taken there. Everybody is kept out of trouble just about for the first few corners, but Craig Dolby underlining that he's a real talent and also underlining that now with a different band of people operating this net, and it is going incredibly well. Up towards the end of the opening lap, then out of the Wilstein curve, 31. Bentley, that is the car in the hands of Max Buch, ahead of the championship contender number seven, with Guy Smith at the wheel as the cars head towards the end of lap one. Yeah, it's Max Buch, the car I'm going to keep an eye on. Bentley, 31, all over the rear of the Nissan number 23 coming up into the chicane, but in fact, both Bentley's nose to tail. And they look, the other Nissan uses all that horsepower that had to get past the 99 Mercedes into the chicane. And Max Buch there having a nibble at the back of the traffic ahead of him now guy smith looking for a way through as well as they come over the timing line dolby leading zaug in third is helped fourth is chio fifth is book sixth is guy smith that you were riding with a moment ago seventh over the timing line is parent eighth is salikov ninth is jean carl verne and look at this three wide for tenth down to turn one verne's got eighth up the inside round the outside of tignal there goes nico bastian is he going to come out ahead yes he is the mercedes goes by regains that position it was lost a couple of corners ago but uh, bastian did a good job put the Mercedes in the right part of the racetrack and got the benefit going into turn one. And Stefan Mucker's on a mission as well as we look back from Salikov's car then now. Nico Bastian is tucked up behind him in number 99. Harry Tinkle's fallen back a little bit in this is GT debut as the cars head through turns five and six. Now there's the charging out in number one of Jean Calvani and diving up the inside goes Nico Bastian in the Mercedes. Has he done it? Yes, he has. A good move, a place that's difficult to do it normally. There's never enough room left into turn five. But Nico Bastian put the Mercedes on the line, on the apex, and there was his corner. And Stefan Mucker is on a mission as well in number 44, Aston Martin, 19th he is at the moment as the cars work their way down to the Dunlop curve then through that long right-hander. Lots of people in the support races have been off the road and out breaking themselves there. We've got one in the pits already, Christian Kelvers from the back of the grid anyway. An early stopper but the race leaders flink through the Schumacher S. Now Salikov is under attack from Harry Tinknell and he is taking with him the Mauro Engel driven Mercedes. So there's another good battle developing here. There goes Tinknell back up the inside. And Tinknell, this is the first time He's ever raced a GT yeah, car. Exactly, as a GT job. debut, good job done. And there's Engel getting past Salikov as well. So the Mercedes through on the inside, takes the place. So the Pro-Am Ferrari fading a little bit. And Tignal with the wipe rod loses out to Engel. Has he got a problem? Because suddenly up the inside, tried to go Salikov as well. Harry Tignal, single-seater and now LMP2 star. But in danger here, perhaps, of losing more places. We understand also that number three has had a spin, which is the Pro-Am. Christoph Hamon, Audi, got going again. But why was Tinkler losing places there coming out of the chicane? Leaders through, Dolby leading Zaug. Third is Hubert Haupt, who went well here last year. Fourth is Chio. Fifth is Max Book. Sixth is Guy Smith. And there, look, side by side, Jean Calvane losing out to Nico Bastien. The Mercedes has always been good round here. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the best I've seen the Mercedes performing, particularly in the opening laps of a race. It's just got pace over everything yep. that he's come up. He's not had to fight. He's been able to pull up alongside and take the position away cleanly. Lots of grunt in that car. Of course, there's another one even further up the road. Hubert Haupt in third place. There it is, the green Black Falcon car coming into shot now. The car qualified by Yelma Berman. And as the field turns its way through turns five and six, there's a yellow flag in the last sector of the lap that they may end up having to worry about if the car in question can't get going. There it is, an Audi off the road. Yes, off the road. Don't think it's had contact with the barrier, but he's going to have to... It's just so slippery off track. The grass yeah. is saturated. Trying to just get any traction with a slick tyre, even when you get back on the tarmac. And the battle, look at this. The Audi off was Gregoire de Moustier. Place gain for Chio, who's got past Haupt. So up into third place goes Ketsamasa Chio. And now Max Book tries to buy into this as well. You're riding on board with Guy Smith. So it's now a different order. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, heading up the hill. Be harder for Max Book to get ahead of the Mercedes than he thought it might have been to get ahead of Chio in the Nissan. But this is principally the main battle going on in this. What, just five minutes or so into the race. And these are the positions for fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Big flash of the lights there for Guy Smith because he's coming under attack now. He's got Alvaro Perrin tucked up behind him. I think, I think, oh, there's the oh. RD9, the pit lane stopped. I think that Guy Smith feels actually he's quicker than Maximilian Book. Now, not many people would have thought that, but Guy no. clearly feels it. That's why he's on the headlights so aggressively to say, look, I'm quicker than you, let me through, I can make progress. 
So De Moustier pits, but then has a problem. Let's see what Guy Smith can do. He also wants to try and get up past and take the points, take the position, but also get away from a battle because he doesn't want Parent to come past him. That's going to compromise that car's chances even more. But Book, in the meantime, is busy looking for a way past Hubert Haupt, isn't he? Down towards turn one. And he's not able. The Mercedes, I have to say, the performance here is not quite revelationary, but it is very much stronger than maybe I might have seen. In effect, it's a three-hour sprint race. This is not an endurance event. <laughs> it's a three-hour sprint. And that's what we're seeing from this group of cars right now. So the Bentley's running together, and there is Alvaro Parent right up behind them as they work their way once again out of turn number four. Wide goes Smith. Does that give Parent a chance? If it does, it'll be the outside line. Yeah, it certainly put him into the position of being able to put more pressure onto Guy Smith. He ran way, way wide, coming out of turn five, out of turn four, and that was what Alvaro Parent was looking for, the opportunity just to get the momentum and just slide that McLaren. It was going to have to be around the outside, and there wasn't going to be much joy in the exit of the corner because Guy Smith's Bentley would be filling the tarmac. Down they come to the Dunlop curve. Smith now having to defend. Now, what does he do? Does he let Parent go, or does he try and keep him at bay, bearing in mind he's got another two hours and 52 minutes, and he does not want to get in any jeopardy and risk going off? No, and he's not going to let Parent get past. He's got to be, if you like, the rear guard to Maximilian Book. But he is, in doing so, I think, also putting himself under that pressure that he's got because he believes, as I mentioned earlier, he's quicker than Book at this stage of the race. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Bentley ought to consider, surely, swapping them over. Book should be playing rear guard for Smith and getting him up the order. Difficulty is putting it into effect because you might yeah. then compromise both cars and try to you know, enact that scenario and let either Parent get past one or both or let Hope get away further from the two Bentleys. It's true enough. There's Jean-Carl Verne under attack. Look, because the Black Falcon Mercedes Amaro angle goes through and another Mercedes, ideally suited to this circuit, up the inside and gains the place easily. Now, if you said this is the 24 hours of Nürburgring, I would say <laughs> it is ideally suited, but we're seeing three Mercedes independently driven different drivers, and all three have made very good progress yeah. in these opening minutes. But go back to two seasons ago, we had a Mercedes second overall, and in the same race winning Pro-Am, they got a good track record around this configuration of the Nürburgring, so the field pouring over the line. Just look at this, still they come out of the last corner. Mucker under attack, is diving up the inside there. Is the Ferrari, Morgan Moulin Trafford, not able to find a way by. This is 15th and 16th they're battling for. Yeah, I mean, the Ferrari looked as if it was going to slip down the inside, but Stefan Mucker, canny driver that he is, he probably just took a bit of pressure off the brake pedal to make it very difficult for the Ferrari to take the corner, and by doing so... And again, look how much quicker the Ferrari was coming through the exit of Turn 3. Not much difference on the exit of 4 and on the run down into Turn 5. Replay of the start, then, as the cars accelerated over the line. Good start by Mirko Bortolotti, but what a move by Dolby up the inside. I mean, in a sense, the two front row grid cars are watching each other, and they didn't think about Craig Dolby, but, of course, he's got an identical car to Chio in the at number 23 Nissan, and we know the Nissan with that turbocharged V6 engine coming off the rolling start has got that bottom end grunt that can drag the car. The initial, maybe first 50 or 60 metres, really give it a good punch. And again, a replay in the pack of the two Bentleys getting together and making contact with each other. And have a look at this, looking back from Bentley number seven. They come down towards turn number one. Guy Smith at the wheel of this car. And there's a bit of contact with the McLaren, so that was Alvaro Parent losing out. And then there's the little whack that gets the car all unsettled. Replay of the start from Chio's point of view. Yeah, I think just a little bit of nerves on the part of Chio. I mean, overwhelming being in the, you know, the front row, effectively being pull position, but you can see Craig Dolby, he wasn't overwhelmed. He saw the gap on the right-hand side, it's a right-hand corner, and as long as he can get his Nissan stopped without overrunning, and he just about did it, did it. He was able to take the lead from the Lamborghini, and of course, Chio, in doing so, went from second on the grid, front row of the grid, back to fourth, two places lost. So, up front, Craig Dolby it is who leads the way, and the gap that he's pulled out is already three and a half seconds. Now, what's happening to Audi? Because those cars are slipping away, and Vincent Voss can explain he's at the pits with OJ Paul. Been the best start to the race performance wise. The Audi seems to be going backwards. Well, we have difficult time, you know, especially when the first few lap in the traffic it's been quite difficult. We will see, we have to wait that it's uh, it's going down a bit and we will see what, what is the real pace. But for sure, for us, like this, when we have many cars around us, 
as you all know, we don't have a much uh, top speed, so it's it's quite difficult. Let's wait a bit. In 20 minutes, we will know a little bit more. Thank you very much. Well, certainly with Van Sarvals, you know he's speaking defensively there <laughs> and trying to put a shine on a difficult situation. In the first Audi on the grid was on the sixth row of the grid. That's the number one car we've seen on picture. And they had had a poor qualifying for a whole variety of reasons, and half the field could probably cite the same reasons. Nevertheless, this is a three-hour race. Watch when Audi play out their pit stops. There may be strategy if we get safety car intervention or a full course yellow, which is what I would prefer to see. I hate seeing the safety car because that can determine a race which is sometimes unfair. Meantime, Chio is trying to fight back against Adrian Zaug through the so-called motorbike chicane. They come the softer version of the chicane. There's Bob Neville, the team boss of RJM that operates the works. This sounds not the leading car because Craig Dolby's car comes from a different team and it leads by an enormous margin over the timing line. Craig Dolby now has four and a half seconds in hand and here's almost everybody else in a line. Well, what's happening now is Adrian Zaug, who had been within a half, one and a half seconds of the lead car three laps or so ago, has lost pace. His lap time's slowing down. That's what's drawn Chio and the Nissan, the Mercedes, the two Bentleys, all back up together. And it's the pace now of the Lamborghini that's controlling third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh. So here they come with Zaug under attack from Chio, who's under attack from Haupt, who's under attack from Buk, who's under attack from his teammate Smith. And Alvaro Perez is at the back of that little queue in seventh spot. So a fantastic battle pack it is, running for second place. But keep an eye on the eighth place Mercedes there, the Rover racing car, because that Nico Bastian is catching up to the pack ahead. Mauro Engels, Mercedes is ninth and then tenth. The first of the Audi, Jean-Carl Verne goes through ahead of uh, the car of Greg Gilbert, Marcus Winkelhock is next, and the Audi's getting themselves together, but much further down than Vincent Voss and others want them to be. Yeah, but I think, in, in fairness to WRT and the Audi teams, they know this is a three-hour race. I'm really going to watch Nico Bastian, because he's the driver, apart from Craig Dolby, who's pulling away comfortably, four and a half second advantage over the second place, Adrian Zag, but Nico Bastian, he's got uh, Alvaro Parent in the sights, he's lapping quicker. The problem he is going to face is, as he is catching up to the tail of the McLaren, his pace will then be dictated by the pace of the Lamborghini six cars further up the line. Unless Bastian can execute the kind of overtakes we've seen so far in this race, and that is, there's a bit of clear air between the guy Smith Bentley and Alvaro Perret. That's what Nico Bastian needs. He doesn't want the McLaren to be on the tail of the Bentley. That would then effectively mean it would be hard to pass a car at a time. He needs to be able to do the one by one on one to get himself to the tail of the Lamborghini to be within a chance. And right now, don't forget that Frank Stippler's championship leading car is in 18th place overall, 15th in class and out of the points. So let's see as the cars come over the line whether this time Chio is going to be able to make a move against the Lamborghini. This is how the Pro Cup would look if things stay as they are. The Nissan would take the class in the championship over the Audi of Ortelli and Schlepper because that's not yet scoring. And Nico Bastian and Steph Dusseldorf's Mercedes would bag third. But there's an awful lot of water to flow under the bridge before we get to that point. Yeah, we're just 15 minutes into this three hour race. And again, Chio all over the Lamborghini coming through the exit of turn three. Again, the Mercedes Hoop, Hoop and Hoop. <laughs> Hoop and Hoop, I should say. Again, the same process, just having to sit the, the fifth car on that line is the white and yellow 99 Mercedes. Again, Nissan trying to use alternative lines to get the run off. And uh, an opportunity coming down the hill out of turn six, all the way down into turn seven. Adrian Zaug, very experienced, very canny, single-seater driver by instinct. Knows how to make, you see, goes in early, but runs up a little bit wide, and that almost allows Herbert Hoop to come through in the Mercedes. Yeah, Haupt tries to get past Chio because he was sort of on the wrong line along with uh, Zaug, wasn't he? So Hubert Haupt tries to buy into that, can't quite do it. And while they're all squabbling like this, Craig Dolby is now 5.6 seconds up the road. It's not even in shot, he's done Lapry already, he's got past Gary Kondakov. Chio thinks about the inside, he's being held up by the Lamborghini, and he's got Hubert Haupt crawling all over the back of him. Yeah, and it's really the Mercedes that. It's going to be the car I think we should keep an eye on because as Chio tries to look one way, look the other way, and all his concentration is going forward, that's going to give the Mercedes driver that opportunity to take advantage. If, as we saw going into turn seven, just on this lap, where the Lamborghini ran slightly wide, it was followed, and there's a mistake. That's the one of the lap cards getting out of the way. Yeah, it's getting away. Just had a moment of panic there <laughs> as he saw the view from the camera, but it was the Ferrari that had been lapped originally by a race leader. The two Bentleys again, nose to tail. Guy Smith has given up on flashing the lights because he's had no reaction <laughs> from Maximilian Book. 
and I wouldn't expect the German to be phased by... Oh, the light, there we go, the light's back on again. Well, the punt, isn't it, guys? So, this time he's going to make the move. Look, going into turn one, he's done it. So that's good for Bentley for the championship. Guy Smith goes through, and now Max Book has to fend off the traffic behind. It's his job now to keep everybody else behind Guy Smith. Bentley number seven, then, goes ahead of what's normally number eight. This weekend, 31, taking the number that won the 500-mile race at Brooklands in 1929, where Jack Barkley and Frank Clement were the winners in the four-and-a-half-litre, and they're hoping that by using that number, a little bit of good fortune might just smile on the car. That's had rotten luck all year. Well, let's see. Guy Smith has finally got ahead of his sister car. His job is now to chase the Mercedes, to chase the Nissan, to chase the Lamborghini. I wonder also, Alvaro Perez, will he think now, well, let's see if we can get past number Bentley. We saw that the number seven car get past the 31. Maybe now my McLaren will have enough legs to put itself ahead of the Maximilian book driven Bentley. Another little lock-up, a little slide by Chio going down to the Dunlop curve. He's still on the back of Adrian Zaug, and this is Guy Smith taking the place off book. Yeah, I mean, he's quite a long way behind, and I just wonder, was that... A little bit instigated from the pit wall because he was normally in a racing context. The gap was quite too much, I'd expect, to see an easy overtake like that. Maximilian Book would have normally been more aggressive in his defence, so I suspect the message has come from pit wall. If you've got a problem, if you're not able to run at the pace you feel you can, and we think Guy Smith can run more quickly, let him go. Indeed so. Meantime, Craig Dolby's advantage is now over seven seconds. Hubert Haupt there in the Mercedes, heads up here as Chio thinks and has a look for the inside, but again, he's quicker, but Zaug's defending well here. Yeah, I mean, Zaug is going to be using every bit of the tarmac that he needs to to keep that second position away from the Nissan. Nissan clearly has got more lap time, but not able to make, to, to make use of it to access. And now Hubert, Hubert Hooper is on the Mercedes, on the tail. Watch the Mercedes. Can it dive out down the inside into turn one? He's going to have a look, but so too is Chio against the Lamborghini. So who's going to come out of this ahead? Hubert Hout wants to try to buy into it. Guy Smith, of course, is closer to that battle as well now. Yeah, but Hubert Hout did the right thing, and now he's really in a good position. It'll not be through turn three. There's not an awful lot you can do. And here we have this battle between the... Well, we've got two Mercedes running tail gunner as such. So the Nissan runs slightly wide. The Mercedes can hold the tighter line. That'll give it the benefit of speed off turn four and the run down into turn five. So a little bit of breathing space for Adrian Zarg, but it's only momentary. Indeed so, because they're all queued up behind still, and look, the Mercedes have joined the line as well, haven't they? Not only has Nico Bastian caught up to them, but he's brought Mario Engel with him. The former runner-up in the British Formula 3 Championship as he heads off downhill there now in the Black Falcon, the black and yellow Mercedes on the back of the Rover racing car. Zaug then heads this group, but remember that up front it's still Craig Dolby, whose advantage now is eight seconds. Well, can you be surprised, because he's running about a second a lap faster than this bunch of cars. So every lap goes by, could chunk another second, another yeah. second, another second. And Craig's got clear air. He's driving his own race under no pressure, not putting any stress or load into his car, other than above just running at a very quick race pace. And all the field behind is being really backed up unintentionally, but backed up by Adrian Zag in the Lamborghini in second place. He's the cork in the bottle, isn't he? As soon as he could be dislodged, everybody will go flying past and get away. But for now, because he's got wide elbows, he's uh, being able to keep that car in second spot. Again, Chio San Close is upcoming into the chicane. There's Hubert Haupt in fourth place. What about the two Mercedes? Can Bastian make any more progress? He's got himself onto the back of Parent. Of course, the higher up the order you go, the harder it is to make progress. You're in quick cars. There is the leader, Craig Dolby, then, to the delight of his fan club. The Dolby Dolls watching at home. The advantage at the end of ten laps is nine seconds. And then Zaug heads this battle pack for second that takes you from second to ninth in a line. And is Chio going to have a go? Thought about it, found a Lambo in his way. Yeah, I mean, Adrian Zaug is basically anticipating what Chio Sanders is going to do in the Nissan. And if you're coming down into turn one, you don't leave a big wide gap down the inside. You, you make it as narrow as possible without putting yourself at a disadvantage on the exit of turn one. And then into this very long turn two, evolving into turn three. It's the Mercedes yet again. Hubert Haupt is the one that I'm keeping an eye on because we think that, the, you say, a good analogy, the cork in the bottle being the Lamborghini, but I think once this group can break free from the Lamborghini, it's the pace of Hubert Haupt that's going to yeah. be, I think, the challenge to Chio, and he will really feel the heat from the Mercedes. Heading downhill, this is lap 11, three-hour race, and you can see the clock counting down to the end, but we've still got an awful lot of good racing to look forward to. Adrian Zaug again into the Dunlop curve. Chio takes that wider line that gives Haupt a sniff of the opportunity on the inside. Guy Smith is there in fifth place. And in sixth spot, still Max Book. 
there, Fabio Babini, with the sunnies on his head, who will do the, probably the third stint in that car, looks on from the pit bunker. He will drive, in fact, the sister car, number 19, the one that won at Monza, but he's not yet behind the wheel. He saved himself until the last stint. Since Guy Smith has overtaken his teammate, and Guy Smith is in, in fifth place, the progress that he had thought he might be able to make, it's not really happening, no. I mean, principally, because, like, Maximilian Buch found when he was behind uh, the Nissan, he couldn't really do an awful lot of money either, so everybody's being held up, in effect, by the pace of the second-place Lamborghini. And we need a little bit more action to evolve to get this group broken up and allow the true pace of these six or seven or eight, nearly eight cars now running through second through to ninth place. Yeah, drivers tell you it's not an easy track on which to overtake, and the best chance is down into the Mercedes arena, which is at the end of this straight. And again, as they come over the line, it's Zag in second, four tenths up on Chio. Is he near enough to think about making a move? Well, he's always thinking, but he hasn't got the gap, and he's also mindful not to try anything that won't work and therefore give Haupt a chance in the next sequence of corners. Another factor you've got to consider, it, it shouldn't be coming into play as early as we are in the race, but this is a really hard circuit on brakes. And a big, big break into turn one. You've got another big, big break all the way down into turn seven. And then at the end of the lap, you've still got a fairly substantial, but not as big. And the brakes don't really get a great time to recover. So wear is an issue. I don't think anybody will need to change pads, but if it's not wear, then it could be heat. And running as these cars are more or less nose to tail, that's where you will do a bit of damage to your brakes in that they will get overheated. So the clever ones might just lag back for a lap or so and get some clean air in. And they can see the Bentley of Guy Smith is just dropping away slightly. And off the road has gone Gary Kondakov in the Kaspersky Ferrari. That's at the chicane. It's well and truly beached in the gravel. Now, let's hope this doesn't either have a circuit full course yellow or a safety car. It's in the gravel. It will have to be retrieved. It wouldn't be able to get himself out of there. Now, what did he do all wrong? Well, just trying to get out of the way fundamentally to be the decent guy. And, uh, of course, onto the gravel. And once it then spins and buries itself going sideways like that, it will not be able to reverse out. So it'll need a, a truck to pull that car away from the corner and hopefully it can get it back into the race. Yeah, not for the first time this year we've seen Gary Kondakov in strife, but hopefully that car can rejoin. The car's heading up now towards the chicane, and as the yellow flags are waved into the yellow flag zone, they go at the chicane, but as yet, no suggestion that it's going to need a safety car, but if anybody else ran off, they're going to hit that, aren't they? It's not it's in a good place, and I mean, I, I just think I mean, a full circuit, full course yellow would be my view. There is the pickup or the snatch vehicle that will put a, a rope onto the front of the Ferrari, pull it to safety, might be able to pull it into the pit yeah. lane itself and then yeah. let the car drive through the pit lane, clear all the gravel and muck. In this hand, still looking, but you know, it, it, it's all it's doing is showing its nose, it's not doing anything more that is threatening. And Adrian Zag probably feels now reasonably comfortable that he's not really under serious threat. Yeah. So what's going on in the Nissan thought process? Bob Neville has the answer, and he's with OJ in the pits. Bob, what's the plan here? What's the strategy? Chio's being held up, and he's got a Mercedes all over the back of him. What do you tell him to do? We're just telling him to uh, keep calm about it, not to worry about it. Not, Is he going to press? Not to be tempted to try and dive down the inside. But surely, watching the other, the other GTR disappear off into the distance, yeah. you want it to get past that Lamborghini? Yeah, we do. We, we'd love him to get by it, but uh, we're not worried about the other GTI. Not in the championship, you know, so... Just, just don't want to incur any damage going by him. So currently the plan is stay calm, stay where you are. Try and stay calm. Thank you, Bob. And now, look, Chio is under attack. Hubert Hout gets to drive up the hill, get all the grunt from the Mercedes. We've seen it here every season in Blancpain. Over the kerb goes Hout. That compromises his run, and now Guy Smith makes a move up the inside. But it's the outside for the next corner. They lean on each other. Hubert Hout's got the inside line. He'll go back ahead. He takes the place back again. And Max Book arrives on the tail of Guy Smith as well. Good effort, that, by Guy Smith. Opportunistic stuff. It did not quite pay off. No, it was a mistake by Hubert Hout coming up into turns. Eight and nine got the car out of shape. Guy Smith read it perfectly, got the run, but of course he got the run on the outside as they go into a left-hand corner, and easy for Hype to recover and to consolidate. But you know, it's little errors like that that are all you need just to break up, break up this line of the, the front nine cars. On board with Nico Bastian then, he's on the tail of the McLaren, that's Alvaro Parent at the wheel. Parent, you could argue as well, surprisingly, has not been able to make progress because he doesn't lack anything in the talent department, does he? Not at all. But again, he's like everybody else, it's, the, it's their momentum. 
is being stalled. Uh, yeah. But the gap, as you can see, just the Mercedes has fallen back that little bit more than we have expected. And now, looking at number 99, Nicky Bastion, that's indicating that Alvaro Parent was either a little bit aggressive on the brakes and overran, or is himself suffering a little bit of problem. And uh, the Mercedes comes up and tries to get down the inside, forcing Parent to go slightly wider to avoid the contact. Now, that was good awareness from Parent. He avoided what would look like it could have been a bit of right front, left rear. And consequently, Nicky Bastion again putting a big pressure onto the McLaren into downhill turn six, turn five, and then the, the right hand turn six. Well, there was half a gap, but no real opportunity to find a way by Nico Bastian then, who's been very impressive this year in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series and having another very good run here in the number 99 Mercedes as the cars power off downhill once again. He's got Mauro Engel still right on his tail, but Nico Bastian then now accelerates uphill once again. Former Polo Cup racer, former Mini racer, former Seat racer, but he knows his way around here. That's good enough because he's done lots of ADA CGT races, he's done lots of BLN races. We've seen him in Blanc Pan Sprint also, so doesn't lack anything in terms of experience. Nor does this man, Hubert Haupt, who is still stuck fourth as the cars turn their way out of the Bilstein curve once again. And he's not yet got himself back onto terms with the Nissan. He might be just taking a breather for a lap. Oh, and the safety car is safety. deployed. Oh, safety no. car deployed then. Full course yellow. Why have we got a safety car? I mean, a full course yellow would be the most, for me, suitable. All you've got to do is get that tow truck, get the thing attached to the. What are they doing? They are on the. Oh my God! I can't even begin to wonder. I wonder. I mean, how surely they could remove that car more quickly. I mean, a full course yellow, in my view, and I'm not the race director here, but in my view would have been the appropriate uh, situation. But there we are. Safety At least it has picked up the race leader. It has indeed. Important, important. And no, it's, that is really crucial that it picks up the race leader. So no one in effect has lost out, except this man in the lead, Craig Dolby. All that hard work he did to build up a nine and a half second advantage. It's gone. Now, after the... Jules Bianchi accident of last year, the FIA made a change to its sporting code that said if you've got a car that's needing to be snatched out of the gravel and it needs double waved yellow flags, that these days is not enough. You have to have a safety car to go with it. So the race director has got very little choice in this, unfortunately. Yes, so the safety famous. car is needed. And there they are. The lead, which was 9.3 seconds, has disappeared. Let's hear from Steph Dusseldorp. His car is down in eighth place, and Steph is in the pits with OJ. Steph currently in eighth position. You need to beat the Nissan that's currently in third. You need to get on with this, don't you? You really need to get moving. Yeah, the Nissan is looking very, very strong at the moment. Uh, but there's still a long way to go, and... Uh, you know, Nico does a, does a wonderful job. He's, uh, he's looking quite strong as well. He has some troubles overtaking the, the McLaren, but as I said, there's a long way to go, and uh, I'm confident we can get close or uh, even pass them. It, it, I mean, it's, it's silly to say this right now, but I'm saying anyway. At what point do you stop panicking that you're too far back? I never stop panicking until the end of the race. Um, it's, yeah, it's very exciting, and stuff just keeps happening on the Nürburgring, so... You know, it's, it ain't over till, uh, till you uh, pass the, the finish flag and uh, we'll see what we end up then. You're still confident though? Yeah, I'm still confident. Nico is looking great, the car is looking great, so uh, yeah, I'm pretty hopeful. Thank you, Steph. So that car currently running in eighth place and with still two and a half hours, anything can yet shake out of this. So we are behind the safety car while the Ferrari is retrieved. And Gary Kondakov having gone off the road, we were hopeful that it might be an easy retrieval but it's needing more marshals to work trackside and if that is the case the FIA regs say you've got to have a safety car so out it comes indeed and obviously well there's I mean the car is buried up to its axles yeah and the snatch vehicle straining and obviously the concern as you mentioned from over a year ago uh, in Japan the outcome of that was tragic and of course that's the regulation but you know they're pulling the car sideways through the sand why could the car not be pulled by its nose away? I mean, rather than doing, you couldn't put it in a more difficult fashion. Now the gravel, I mean, the gravel's a mess. Are they going to leave the gravel like that? Because if a car goes sideways into that, it could potentially cause the car to turn over. But anyway, it seems that the way the car is being dragged, it's causing as much of a problem as the car was in the first place by being in the gravel. 
So it's on the grass verge. It is now feasible that the car can be driven back to the pits. So the car's now behind the safety car. We're on lap 16. And the field in the order. Craig Dolby then, his 10 second give or take advantage, disappears altogether. Tremendous first stint. And Craig once again reminding people that he's not forgotten how to drive, he's not got any slower just because he's not been in the limelight. And a very good first stint. Now, Martin Plowman, one of his co drivers, did a great job this morning in qualifying as well. Let's hear from Martin now. He's with OJ in pit lane. Martin, there's time for yellow and there's times you don't want a yellow and this is one of those times you don't want one. Yeah, this is a shame. The first stint by Craig was mega. He got like a 10 second lead on the field. That Lamborghini was really helping us out, kind of bunching up the whole field. So uh, it's a real shame that we got this yellow now, but still a long way to go. The car's great and uh, hopefully we'll bring it in first place at the end. Well, you said the car's great. It seems to have a real advantage over everyone else. Why Why is this car going so well? I don't know. It's, it's just a, you know, a new team this weekend. We've got uh, you know, some really good engineers that have been working on the car in, in America all year and combined with our full-time guy Gus this, this weekend it's just a really good chemistry and uh, you know it's just really come together this weekend and you seem really enthusiastic and really excited about driving that car how much do you want to get in there and show what you can do on the track I can't wait I, I just hope it stays dry I mean I, I don't mind it being wet or dry but it's just obviously a lot less stress when it when it's dry so uh, I'll wait and see just keep my fingers crossed and how much have you been looking at that weather app to see what it is going to do um, every five every five minutes <laughs> <laughs> thank you much. thank you Martin Plough and somebody else reminding people how good he is. British driver, comes from Burton on Trent, but he's done the bulk of his racing initially in carts and single seaters in mainland Europe, and then he went off to race in America. So many Brits haven't even heard of him, but he's another great talent. Yeah, and he's going to be the third driver in what is currently the leading uh, Nissan. So uh, that's being entered by or being run by Always Evolving Motorsport, a US based company very familiar with Nissans and doing a very strong job in North America. And I think the influence that they've brought to the team over the last couple of events where they've been directly involved has shown through, not least of all here first in qualifying, and now a really strong showing from Craig Dolby. I mean, it's been made slightly easier for them by the fact that the Lamborghini has been backing everybody up, as we heard Martin Plumman say there. So one more lap behind the safety car. Gary Kondakoff's Ferrari has made it back to the pit lane, but it's going into his pit box, so the gravel can be vacuumed out of it, and then the car, I suspect, will rejoin the race, and there the track will need sweeping, I suspect, also. Yes, you know, gravel on the racetrack is never a, a happy sight, but uh, it's been known, you know, tyres getting cut down by, that looks pretty good, Pebble, it looks like what they call a stonewash round pebble or something. I know that because at Silverstone had about half the quarries worth in Great Britain in all its gravel traps over many years. So the field turning its way now through the Mercedes arena. There is Craig Dolby, the race leader. And if you gambled on putting your quick driver in, your quickest driver in first, the plan disappears. But of course, in the Pro Cup, largely they're very, very evenly matched these days on pace. How was Stefan Mucket getting on before the safety car? Because 15th, despite the car's problem on the formation lap, he was another one finding it hard to find a way through. Part of it, the balance of performance that makes the car so equal by design, but also it's just not an easy track on which to overtake anyway. No, I, mean, I hate to say it, but the, the majority of overtaking at the end of this first hour, it's going, over, it's going to take place during driver changes, pit stops. Yeah. And there will be teams that are outstanding in the pit lane who will use that to their advantage, and there'll be other teams that are maybe not quite as experienced or quite you know, as, as capable, and that's where the most overtakes will happen. Now, what about Bentley's chances as the race goes on? Malcolm Wilson of Bentley can tell OJ all about it. Malcolm, when you've got two of your cars racing each other, as a team boss, how does that make you feel? Ah, it's good at the moment, I have to say. I'm quite happy if we can uh, keep the pressure on the way they are. Then, uh, yeah, it's looking OK. But some of the guys are a bit nervous, but to be honest, uh, I think they both know what's at stake this weekend and uh, they realise the job they've got to do. Was it team orders to let car seven through, or was that racing instinct? No, just racing instinct. I mean, it was a clean move by Guy. I mean, as I said, they both know they've got to stay out of trouble. Um, and, yeah, it was just a clean move by Guy. Would you ever step in? Was there ever the point where you think, come on, guys, let's calm this down. Let's, you know, we've got good position on the track. We're still trying to win something here. Oh, there's no question we would if uh, if it gets to the point, you know, the final stage of the race and we're in with a chance of the championship then for sure. So what do you do then to get ahead of that Nissan? Uh, we just keep the pressure on and uh, we could see the, the performance is starting to drop off a little bit. So uh, hopefully we can. But as you can see, we're all caught in traffic and uh, it's difficult to get past at the moment. So it's quite tight track in places. So. 
uh, let's see what the rest of the afternoon brings. Thank you, Matt. Cheers. Yeah, of course, Malcolm, you've got to get past the hub, hub Mercedes as well before you can get onto the tail of the 23 in Nissan. But clearly, you know, the Bentley's pace, we know it is a quick, quick car. But uh, that Mercedes of Hubert Hub is the car that's going to put a lot of pressure on Chio as they come down into turn one, and it's a green flag. And Haupt is ideally placed, isn't he? He's right on the back of the Nissan. But then it sort of booms away, does the GTR in a straight line, so the Mercedes loses a couple of lengths back onto the tail under brakes for turn one. And Dolby's trying to get away, but now we'll see who's really on their toes on the restart. This, with everybody bunched up, is where you could gain a place. Trouble is, safety cars breed safety cars, so it's also feasible that you might get a bit of contact in the pack as they all go for the same bit of road. Yeah, everybody, oh, and the Chihu using a lot oh. of the inside kerb just to hook the wheel on the inside of the, the curbing and hold the car in. Uh, everybody's had a little bit of a breather, the tyres have had a chance to get a little bit more uh, back to normal operating temperatures and not the strange stress that they would have been under following cars so closely. Again, now that this race has got underway, it's going to be very tight for the opening three or four laps until things again form a pattern and then begin to settle down. So can Craig Dolby extend the advantage? I suspect the fan club, the Dolby Dolls, will shout yes at the screen. As there yes. wide goes Zaug down at the Dunlop curve. Now, does that give Chio a chance to get the run coming up the hill? Let's see. No, no. he can't take advantage. Again, that very, very svelte shape of the Hurricane. He's able to stay ahead of the Nissan and the Mercedes. Hubert Haupt is still there in fourth place. I, I think that was an opportunity. He was slightly lost because the Lamborghini got well off and I would call the natural line, and that was an opportunity for the Nissan to forcefully... I mean, it was going to have to be forcefully find a way to get alongside up the hill into turn eight and nine and try and try and again wrong foot the Lamborghini driver. Max boot wide in the background hooked a wheel into the dirt as he tries to fend off Parent. Through goes Chio, Wolfgang right there, the bespectacled Alex Buncombe watching on with uh, Darren Cox in the red coat, the global motorsport manager of Nissan as Bastian has a cheeky look at the inside of Parent. Doesn't work going into the chicane. Can he make a run up the inside of the Coca-Cola curve? He thought about it. Parent moves across and defends. But watch off this corner. Parent had to go defensive. Didn't get the best line into the corner. Bastian had a better exit. The gap between the two cars is pretty static. And let's see if the Mercedes has got any more horsepower down oh. the straight. Coming over the line, the other Nissan has just creamed itself up against the pit wall, and that has got debris on the road. We're going to end up with another safety car. I fear as Perret gets assaulted by Bastian at turn one, and round he goes into the gravel. Two separate incidents on the restart. And that will also probably see a penalty for the Mercedes because that was unavoidable contact. Perret was ahead. He got tagged on the right rear by the Mercedes Benz, and it's in the gravel trap, and we've got it again. A yellow flag, whether the can be retrieved more quickly or it's going to be another safety car. But we've also got this Nissan that's parked on the pit straight. Harry Tinknell's car got contact coming out of the last corner, went into the pit wall and it's out of the race with a lot of damage and it's on the pit straight facing the wrong way. So uh, we've got two incidents within the first part of the lap which are going to have to be attended to. And there is the Nissan in question. Harry Tinknell's car up against the pit wall. Darren Cox not happy about that nor will Von Ryan be about this site because the car is in the gravel at turn one. Number six, Marcus Winkelhock versus Greg Gilvair, and Winkelhock goes round the outside there, going out of the Dunlop curve. It is possible to overtake there. Yes, but I mean, in fairness, Marcus Winkelhock slightly ahead of the curve, literally, in this case, metaphorically, in terms of driver skill and ability, and just used that experience to put himself ahead of the sister ID up the hill into now turn 10. So, Harry Tinknell off on the pit straight, but with a bit of an assistance. And number 99 has got a punctured tyre, if not worse, as a result of the contact yeah, with Alvaro Perez. Yeah, left front, right rear. I mean, the Mercedes had contact. It's ne inevitable you're going to cut a sidewall of a tyre down when you have that kind of contact, both with, from the mechanical part of the car. And there is Harry Tinknell getting out of his car, and uh, what a disappointment. I mean, I've never seen a car facing the wrong way on the Nürburgring. It must have been, I don't know what kind of contact it would have been from the rear or whether just it was, well, we have to find out from Harry, he'll be back in the Nissan garage very quickly. And you can see it's left lots of bits of bodywork on the road, so the recovery team there clearing up bits of Nissan, but they've also got to get the car out of harm's way. And down the pit road, look, comes Rob Bell. Now, this could be a good roll of the dice by Von Ryan. In it comes. It's very early to make a pit stop. It is, but it's gambling, I suspect, on the fact that there might be a safety car here or a full-course yellow because you've got two cars off the road. They did it at Silverstone. 
and because you've got what you know you've got two cars that need retrieval i'm surprised that it's still just a yellow rather than anything more than that others are gambling as well number 99 mercedes is in for its puncture but this could be a shrewd roll of the dice by davy ryan's guys well it, as we said it worked it won them the race at silverstone totally different circuit not necessarily playing to the strengths of the McLaren in the way that Silverstone certainly did, but it was that play, that very early pit stop, got them out of sequence, and then they were the winners when it came to the chequered flag. So the yellow flag zones are in sector one and sector three at the moment, and there's a driver change going on at 99 as well, look. So Nico Bastien, having had to make that early stop, they're going to treat it as a mandatory stop now, and therefore change the strategy. So they've lost time on the inlet because of the puncture. Nico Bastian will have a few words to say about it, I'm sure, but now they're going to try and stay on their own strategy, do the driver change, do the refuel, and not fall too far down. Well, I think Nick, Nico Bastian will have something to say about it, but I think it's Alvaro Perez, who I would really like to hear, because he's going to be really very unhappy from a contact. OK, it was close racing, and we've seen it for the... Well, since this race really got underway 40-odd minutes ago, it's been nip and tuck all the way into Turn 1, but on this occasion, the Mercedes was not sufficiently alongside the back of the McLaren to say, this is my corner, and the contact was inevitable. There is the Mercedes returning to the track, and it's returning at the point when the lead Nissan is coming down. Now, this is interesting because the pace that the Mercedes has got is not dissimilar to the lead yeah. but now Nissan, and what Craig Dobby will not want is to have to be held up. He should, in theory, be allowed to go through if uh, the Mercedes is doing his job. But crucially, it stayed on the lead lap, hasn't it? So number 99 has stayed on the lead lap. That is significant. Also into the pit lane has come the number one Audi. Jean-Carl Verne comes in. So again, team's gambling here, but still we've got the recovery of the Nissan on the pit straight. They're going down the pit road. Briefly, you saw number one Audi. Double wave yellows all the way down the start and finish line as the Harry Tinknell Nissan is being retrieved. Now the cars on that 21. And we understand, news from the pits, that Harry Tignall's car cut out coming out of the last corner and he got a whack from behind from somebody, which then turned him around. I mean, what can happen is if you run up against the limiter, some, of, some engine limiters are quite aggressive and it literally just cuts everything. Yeah. And it, it, the effect is that suddenly the car stops going forward. And if somebody's right on your tail, of course, they're going to be completely wrong-footed by it and that could be just quite as simple as that. Well, the downside is Harry Tingle's impressive GT debut is no more. Lots and lots of teams now getting ready for more pit stops. Number one, Audi gets away. So, a pit out, you just blast straight back onto the track. And, of course, that car will stay on the lead lap as well. Good cycling through of the pit stops there. Dolby's advantage being increased. And even though we've had this car parked on the pit straight, it's being removed. Harry Tingle's car is not far away from the vehicle access point on pit straight, so without the need for a full course yellow or a safety car for it, the track very soon is going to be clear again. Yeah, there we are, back on board with Chiu San. Let's find out from Harry what happened. He was uh, somewhat startled, I think, to get stuffed into the wall, but he's with OJ to tell the tale. Harry, after an amazing start, it's a shame to see you stripped off and back in the pits. What happened out there? Yeah, um, we just seem to be having intermittent power issues, and two times before the safety car, the car cut out the exit of a corner and uh, lost a couple of places. I think I thought it could have been fine for the leading pro-am, but... Uh, and then uh, after the safety car, obviously, bunched everyone up. Around the last corner, exactly the same fa thing happened, just... Uh, they went to get on the power, and then suddenly every everything just cut off, and the Ferrari behind me was super close, had nowhere to go, and just hit me from behind, and sent me into the wall, but... Uh, a little bit of a knock, but did to fight another day. Are you more frustrated or disappointed? Ah, just disappointed, really, because you know, first GT weekend, didn't really get much running yesterday, but it was going really well. They you were know, doing the same pace as the leaders, um, and it was the first time I jumped in the, a GT car of any sort yesterday, and really gutted for Gita and, and uh, Ricardo because they're super fast, you know, come through the GT Academy program, doing a fantastic job, and uh, I think we're on for definitely a class podium, if not a win today. And what happens when one car of a team has an electrical problem? Do you start looking at the other one and worrying about it there? Um, I guess so, but uh, I guess that's up to the engineers and the people to, uh, to, to decide. But I think so far the 23 car has been running pretty well and uh, Chiu's doing a fantastic job. And obviously uh, Wolfgang and Alex to come, you know, two fantastic drivers. Hopefully they can win the race and win the championship. And one final question. If you were Chio and you had a choice, you can either keep attacking and overtake or hold off and defend. What would you do? I think in this situation, you know, you've got nothing to lose. Um, you know, the, the, they're not the cars leading the championship. They, they've got everything to win and, and nothing to lose, really. So I would just keep going flat out, try and get in a lead, pull a gap and, uh, and then see what happens behind. A great driver's view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.
So big disappointment for Harry Tignall. The car has been retrieved from the pit straight, so uh, that job was done without the need for a full course yellow or a safety car. The track is clear once more. Up front, Craig Dolby is getting away. The gap is extending, not quite as markedly as it was before the safety car, but it is building, as you can see. It's still Zaug ahead of Chio, ahead of Hout, ahead of Smith, ahead of Book, ahead of Engel, because, of course, he's up to seventh now with the dramas for Nico Bastian. Steph Dusseldorp took the car over and is in 48th place. And Steph Dusseldorp right now actually pulling away from Craig Dolby, which is quite normal because he's got a brand-new set of tyres, and there's another Mercedes with a non, not a non-familiar problem. The girl wing is doing its girl thing and uh, is... And you can't, the driver can't reach it from no, the seat no. because he's held in so tightly by the six-point seatbelt harness. But the battle, look at this, for third place, still is intense. The Lamborghini has dropped away from the tail of the lead Nissan that was literally within one lap of the safety car being withdrawn, falling away. Craig Dolby again lapping in the middle 157s, whereas the Lamborghini lapping in the low 158s. And what we've been seeing through the race, we're now seeing a repeat of, with the exception of the Nico, Nico Passion, and let's look at again this manoeuvre down the inside. Well, in fact, in fairness, he was almost side by side, but of course he was too quick at the point when the McLaren wanted to turn in. I think that might be reviewed, and the blame that I would put on Nico Bastian, when I now see it from this perspective, there's a, maybe a little bit... The, the Mercedes could not turn, it was too tight mm. to the apex, and the McLaren did commit. So that will probably go down as a racing incident because both drivers might have been or could have done maybe a bit more to avoid that collision. But I'm sure Alvaro Brent will feel I was driven off the racetrack and I think it would be very hard to persuade him otherwise. The incident between Harry Tingle and Morgan Moulin Trafford, who was the man that hit him, is under investigation. And so we've heard why the Nissan suddenly slowed, but the stewards hopefully will know that when they have a look at it because Morgan Moulin Trafford is the other man involved. and if. Uh, any penalty flies, then it will obviously be in the direction of the Ferrari, but that's going to be reviewed as the leaders work their way out of the chicane. So we are having had just that one safety car period, another couple of incidents. Alvaro Perret, by the way, was hoiked out of the gravel. He's pitted. The car has rejoined with Bruno Senna at the wheel, but down in 51st place now. It's going to be a long two hours and 12 minutes for that particular car, the 59 McLaren. It's going to be a struggle, and all they can hope for is just to try and retrieve the best they can. As the second of the WRTRDs makes its way into the pit lane. So there's Katsumasa Chio. He runs third, still on the tail of Adrian Zaug. Craig Dolby's advantage continues to extend. It's up to 3.8 seconds now. Frank Stippler has just pitted, by the way, from 15th overall. Yeah, and that's, of course, this is the car that's currently leading the championship. So, again, they've gone slightly out of sync in terms of when would they make their pit stop. And they've decided now to bring Frank Stippler in. And they can either put Stefan Raquelme or Stefan Ortelli into the car. Monegasques both, although Stefan Ortelli, born in France, lives in Monaco. Now there is the returned McLaren, and the driver change goes on for number two Audi. So Frank Stippler, the tallest of them, gets out of the car. It's not number three Audi, ignore that, it's number two that's come in. So it is the Stippler, Raquelme, Ortelli car. Ignore the graphic for the moment. As there is the leader, as the car swoops its way through the Schumacher race. Craig Dolby on his own. Absolutely driven a wheel-perfect drive all the way through 50 minutes of this race and uh, took the lead on the run down into turn one and has never, ever been challenged. And even after the safety car, he was able to pull away quite comfortably and relatively quickly. He's got a 3.8-second advantage as they came across the line at the end of lap 23. Lap 24, it's got to be nearer to five, if not more, seconds yeah. from the second-place Lamborghini. Not hanging around, is he? You can see behind. After that safety car period, the line has broken up just a little bit. Back into the race goes Stippler, but he joins in now. Oh, sorry, the number two Audi rejoins, uh, but it does so behind Rob Bell. So remember the orange McLaren pitch early. Place. In comes out from second place. Finally, shouts Chio. Now he can get his foot down and try and do some decent laps. Well, he's going to have to work very hard because the pace that we've seen the lead Nissan run at has been pretty impressive, and that's been running at over half a second a lap quicker than the 23, effectively, the, you might call the factory Nissan. And again, we've still got that Hubert Hope Mercedes threatening at all times. So a, a late call into the pit lane from Adrian Zau, as he just manages to get across before he clips. So apparently that is permitted, a late call like that. Um, as long as you don't muller the bollard, um, and that's great. So there's the driver change for 63. 
Let's see where that car feeds back in after this pit stop. So now Dolby leads Chio. It's a Nissan 1, 2. It's Mercedes 3, and then it's Bentley 4, 5. Smith ahead of Book. Uh, sixth is Mario Engel now. And Marcus Winkelhock has done good stuff for Ernst Moser's Phoenix team. He's brought number six up into seventh place now. And that's so. the, that's the, normally we never say seventh is the first of the Audis. Yeah. They're not really, it's not been their weekend so far, but as Dan Sanval said, you know, this race is only, uh, well, the result comes after three hours, not after three laps. Indeed so. Where's number one after its pit stop? That car fighting back because it was an early stopper, but it's down in 42nd place. Chihu is beginning to open up a little bit of a gap between the second and third place battle. And now that he doesn't have to worry about the pace of this car, which is now returning, and it's going to be lucky if it can get back on track before it will be OK. It'll be back on track before it goes a lap down. The incident between Bastian and uh, Parent is under investigation as well. Rob Bell's McLaren that pitted early, incidentally, has got a bit of damage on the front, so maybe that was another reason why it came in. Shane van Gisbergen is at the wheel of it, and the team managers of Morgan Moulin Traffold's car and also the uh, Steph Dusseldorf Mercedes both being summoned to race control immediately. That suggests a penalty is heading in their direction, doesn't it? Would indicate there's something going on, and I mean, having seen that on board, that on board stuff between the McLaren and the Mercedes, at one point, it's difficult, difficult, it may be a, it'll be a hard call for whoever gets penalised. So, the race order on screen Nissan's first, second, Mercedes third, Bentley four, five, Mercedes six, and then Audi seventh and eighth at the moment. Of course, now you've got lapped cars in the mix as well. Stefan Mucker comes through, and the lights being flashed at him by the Pro-Am, Aston behind of Stuart Leonard. There is the Emil Frey Jaguar trying to dive up the inside of the Auger Grutz BMW. And third in Pro-Am at the moment is the Jaguar, Freddie Bath at the wheel of it. So remember, it was a third place at Silverstone. They got on the podium at Silverstone in that car, but going strongly, so yeah. another good effort, this. I mean, if you want to see a, a team or a car driver package that fulfills the, what you might say, the, the essence of what Blancpain Endurance is about, that's got to be the car. Yeah, absolutely. And they've worked and worked and worked and worked on a limited budget with one car, so limited data as well. And there have been occasions where we've seen it briefly in the bronze test and no more, but it's good to have it, having had that tremendous result at Silverstone, and again, going strongly here. And the key is, it's going strongly. Because that's often been the case. The Jaguar has maybe shown a little bit of pace, but yeah. poor reliability, now it's showing strong pace and good reliability. Yeah, it's going, and it's going well. 23, Ketsumasa Chio then. We need to look at his sector times relative to Craig Dolby. Well, in the first sector of this lap, in clear air for the first time, he was fractionally quicker, not by much, but fractionally. And in turn, Hubert Haupt, quicker than the pair. So that Mercedes just won't go away. What it wants to do is get ahead of Chihu in second place, but um, now that the, the Lamborghini has dropped out of this battle for the top three places, it's given Chihu a chance to pull away, and as you say, on that last lap, he was fractionally quicker than race leader Craig Dolby, but that's just uh, the ebb and flow. It doesn't, we don't know where Dolby on that lap was, whether he was in traffic or having to deal with things that uh, Chihu was not having to deal with. So blasting back down the pit lane, number 75, Audi, which has served its first mandatory stop, Frederick Verviche at the wheel of the car as it heads back out on track and it is now in 24th and a lap down and almost gets in the way of Max Book there who gets run out wide, Book will have the inside line for the next corner so 31 goes through, takes the place away up the inside but of course they're of comparable pace these cars so Frederick Verviche is going to be a bit of a thorn in the side in this battle, he wants to get through the traffic, Ooh. Book wants to keep him at bay and Mauro Engel needs to get past the Audi as well so that car the leading group really has joined at exactly the wrong time and the wrong place. Certainly, the Audi looked strong for the first time in the race. We're seeing now an Audi delivering, which uh, we've really had to wait until almost the first hours of this race is over. There's 75, then a lap down after the pit stop, but of course it'll gain that back as others cycle through. The lead gap is 4.6 seconds, which is between Dolby and Chio now. And also remember, these cars that are coming out are coming out on new tyres in most cases. Most teams, due partly to the weather over Friday and Saturday, has enabled them to, start to save new rubber. Uh, so coming out new tyres, even with a full load of fuel, you're still going to be quicker than low fuel and worn tyres. Now, number 63 comes up over the timing line. And the Lamborghini, after its first pit stop, is quite a long way down the order now. But of course, number one Audi pitted much, much earlier and has been out of traffic, therefore, 
They've got Robin Fritz behind the wheel, and so on the pit stops, number one Audi has gained hugely against 63. Now, partly a gain from the Audi, what we don't know is whether it was a bad pit stop, because we didn't see all of it, from the Lamborghini squad, but certainly that car has lost relative to the Audi. Well, there may have been a, a, may have been a normal stop for the Grasso Lamborghini team, but we know that WRT are mega in the pit stops, that's where they will snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, and that's the key, as I pointed out earlier in the race, that the ultimate result of this race will be determined by what happens here in the pit lane rather than what's going to happen on the circuit. And significantly, Mirko Portolotti at the wheel of that Lamborghini has done the best middle sector of anybody in the race thus far. He's only done a lap and a bit, so he's absolutely flying. As there, look, Stuart Leonard is under attack because for second in Pro-Am, Freddie Bath is right on the tail of him in the Jaguar. Two British marks together, the Emil Frey Jaguar looks for a way by now. And for the first time, we're saying race leader losing his advantage because second place 23 Nissan was quicker on the last lap by, what, nine tenths of a second. Again, no doubt due to traffic. But that's the first point at any point within an hour that that gap has started to go backwards rather than go forwards. So we've had the change up into second has gone the Jaguar for Pro-Am second place. Up the inside, Freddie Barb, then he gains the position away from Stuart Leonard. Can he get away? Sprints away. Yes, he does get away. So up front, we've got the lead gap coming down. And there, you've got second and third in Pro-Am having reversed themselves as well. There's still a huge amount shuffling out of this. And then you've got the pit stops being cycled through as well. So there's going to be another big, big jump in the order soon. 51 Ferrari out of Pro-Am has just pitted the Cameron Griffin car. There's the leader, but, as John rightly says, a shrinking advantage. Well, shrinking on lap 27. We don't know about lap 28, the lap we're presently on. I suspect that the, uh, whether the Nissan had to pass the Lamborghini or not, I'm not sure we didn't see that, but something caused Greg Dolby to lose the best part of a second, and that would not be ordinary, that would be not normal, uh, unless the driver made a serious error. So I'm suspecting that was that Lamborghini was the reason where the time was lost, and I would imagine that the pace that the lead car will normally be running at is the time that he's now returning to. So we're looking for a, a high 157, maybe a middle 157 from the lead car as it comes across start, finish line, last lap, 157.6. And the gap is 3.8 seconds. A tenth quicker just was Dolby than Chio. Hubert Haupt is falling back a bit now, isn't he, in third place in the Mercedes. Fourth and fifth, Smith ahead of Book still. And in sixth, Mauro Engel, but he's in the traffic. But isn't it ironic that the second place Nissan is now directly behind the car that he was behind, really, for the, the first 27, 26 laps of this race, just because the way the car has been recycled has come back out on track. Now there's 41 Ferrari, that's another of the Pro-Am cars. And Darren Cox from Nissan looks on as they anticipate the crucial first pit stop for number 23. All the effort now can go on one car. Frustratingly, of course, they've lost one Nissan. Kessel Racing's AM car, Triple One team manager being summoned to race control as well. And, of course, that's it with a chance of winning that class in the championship. Mauro Engel being badly held up in traffic here, isn't he? He's got two back markers now ahead of him, and he's falling away from Max Buch. There is a drive-through penalty for the 99 Mercedes for causing a collision. That's the Dusseldorf Bastian Jokadea car, a drive-through penalty for causing a collision. Yeah, I mean, in fairness, you have to say it was the... A car on that was punched off the racetrack and the Mercedes didn't slow down sufficiently and therefore that's what led to the contact. Now this is the trouble that Chia who's got, he's been behind this Lamborghini early in the race. He needs, well, I'm making the Ferrari, another Lamborghini. He needs to find a way past that car really quickly or else Craig Dobby's going to be up and away and extending his lead it was and they came across the line 3.8 seconds. I suspect it's going to be nearer to 4.8 seconds. There's the car that's going to suffer the drive through and he's coming in at the earliest opportunity. Get it out of the way and just get on with it and forget about it. Well, the car was 38th, so it's going to lose places, but it needs to stay on the lead lap. But the problem is it's poor Steph Dusseldorf who's having to take the penalty. And the driver that caused the contact, he's back in the pits, you know, chilling out. How ironic. It's... Yeah, indeed. Team effort and all that. So, Steph Dusseldorf comes down the pit lane, and the race leader is in the pits as well. Look, there is Craig Dolby, so he loses the lead now to Katsuma Sachio, but round of applause for Craig Dolby's first stint. John applauds. Excellent Absolutely. job. I mean, that's what you expect from a driver. <laughs> Been given an opportunity in a competitive car, done a brilliant job, done all he was requested to do, required to do. So now in gets Sean Walkinshaw. Now, this is a big, big challenge. Yes. Sean Walkinshaw needs to get this car turned around, get it back out. The gap between first and second, which was, was with the 23 Nissan, was just about four seconds at the point. So this is going to be about quick 
pit stop and I think always evolving motorsport who are now running this car they will see if they can do a better job than the previous operators. Oh, it's all going pretty nicely so far. You've got one of the Santalock Audis in, Greg Gilver gives way. The other Lamborghini look is in in the background there. That's the number 19 car that's struggled in the hands of your own mill to make huge progress in the first stint. Right, driver strapped in, fuel is in 173, tyres are changed. Where will this car rejoin relative to number one Audi? That's going to be the key to all this because Robin Fritz has got himself up, remember, on the pit stops ahead of the 63 Lambo that he was miles back from early on. 173 is ready to go, just about. Only two mechanics permitted to do the tar stops. It's gruelling work for them with the pressure on, but away goes the Nissan. And there, look, is the Audi that comes down the pit straight. So number one has just bought itself another spot, and the Lamborghini will go ahead of the Nissan as well. Number one, with that decision to pit early, has gained itself huge amounts of ground, and the Nissan has fallen back behind the 63 Lamborghini also. Yes, but remember, those cars, by stopping earlier, they've done, what, the best part of eight laps or so on their tyres. This is a brand new set of tyres on the Nissan, and they are out of sync, so they're depending, relying upon something happening, most likely to be another safety car intervention, to enable them to recoup and, and not be out of sync when everybody else is going through on just simply two more pit stops. But the regulations say just do two. They've done one. They're not going to do any more than that because they know they're going to lose the time. And it's not a fuel critical circuit. So they'll be trying to tweak the strategy to maximize this stint and get themselves for another 70 minutes. So they should be good. The notional pit window that the teams work to opens on lap 20. And they were within that. We've got a drive through penalty for number 111 Ferrari for speeding in the pit lane. And the team manager of the number 22 Nissan now to race control. That was the one that was assaulted. Harry Tinkle's car. Can't imagine why they would be required to go up other than to give an explanation from a technical perspective as to what it, yeah. was it on the car. You don't want to give a driver a penalty if it wasn't the driver's fault. Go along with that. I think that must be the answer, which is good to hear from the race control unit. So now that we've had this first round of pit stops, it's all nice and shuffled. So number one, Audi, looking a lot stronger because of the positions it's gained. There, look, he's 23, Nissan. Captain Masaccio at the helm. And let's hear from Craig Dolby because he's been the hero of the first hour, even though it's lost places on the pit stop. So let's hear what he's got to say for himself. Craig is with OJ. Craig, amazing first stint. It was not just showing what the car can do, but what you can do as well. Yeah, obviously, uh, this year it's been a, a mega year for me. I owe it all to JRM. I um, missed three years of racing full time, and they brought me back. And uh, it's taken a while, but I think I'm showing now what I can do. And uh, this one's for my granddad. He passed away last week, so that's for him. And I think you were showing not just me, but a really emotional drive by both you and Martin as well. Yeah, there's me, Martin, and Sean. We've done a fantastic job this weekend, and uh, I just hope now we can have a clean race to the end. And the car's fantastic, so thank you to the always evolving boys. They've done a fantastic job coming over from America. and. Uh, yeah, the car's mega. And let's just talk about the race quickly, because you did that stint, you came in, but you seem to have rejoined not back in first place. How does that work? No, I think uh, there's a lot of people kind of doing the undercuts, and uh, we'll see, because I think the longer we go, the longer the tyre will last, and round here it seems that the tyre wears away quite quickly, so uh, we'll see where we are at the end, but uh, hopefully it's a good position. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. More Nissan pit stops. Captain Masaccio is in. You're riding with him as he comes down the pit lane. So that's going to give Hubert Hout the lead, going a long way in the Mercedes relative to the others. Yeah. Bentley's likewise. Yeah, we've got the two Bentleys also following behind in second and third place. So they're going to be having to make their pit stops within the next two, three laps. So we get the Nissan in and uh, let's see. It's going to be, yeah, both going right. That would change taking place. So it'll be interesting to see where this car, the pit stop from the Bob Neville's team, so the fuel's gone in now as the four wheels tyre's got to be changed. And it's really about getting that car service as quickly as possible. Mitigating any of the, the little errors that can come in so easy. Just something drops or the, the guy in the air gun just happens to get in the way of the guy carrying the wheel and tyre. There is the car that has dominated this race since the lights went out. But then that pit stop round lost its lead. Sean Wolf control behind the wheel. He's going to get back ahead of the, the number 23 Nissan in my view because the Nissan just beginning to roll. It's, it's, well, let's have a look and see 
Robin Friends in the Audi look. He's going to get ahead potentially. Here comes no, Ryb up to speed. No, he's but not. he can't get the line for the white line yet. So the Audi's on the outside line into the corner. Can he get the undercut as they turn through? Or can Wolfgang Ryb hang on to track position? Robin Friends up to speed, everything up to temperature. He goes around the outside, up the inside of the Audi. Now goes Bortolotti, they touch. The Lamborghini is going to go through, so Bortolotti moves himself up ahead of the Audi and Wolfgang Reip has just been able to hang on to the place. Well, Reip did all he could and he did the best job and he kept the Nissan ahead, but it was poor the, the uh, Robert Friens, I should say, in the Audi that got suddenly compromised and wasn't awaiting, didn't expect to see the Lamborghini being as aggressive and forceful, but the momentum was with the Lamborghini and it's still with Bortolotti in the Lamborghini who is going to give Wolfgang Reip another working out down the yeah. hill into turn seven and then all the way back up the hill through turns eight, nine and into ten. Don't forget Bortolotti, the quickest man on the circuit. He's done the best lap. Hubert Hout, by the way, is pitted. So Guy Smith and Max Boot now are first and second, but they've not stopped. So, of course, when they do, they'll drop down the order and everything will be corrected. What we need to see, though, is where they all feed back in after this first round of pit stops. But Wolfgang Reip, effectively the race leader then, ahead of Mirko Bortolotti, but Robin Frins running in that third spot of those that have made a pit stop. Excellent decision by the WRT team and Adam Hardy at the computer to say, right, this is it, we're going to bring him in early, get Jean-Carl Vernet out of traffic. Hubert Hout then, who was up in that leading group as well, pits. You saw the motor base Aston of Stefan Mucha come in. Away goes Dominic Schwager's black Ferrari. So where next does Hubert Hout rejoin relative to Ripe, Bortolotti and Frins? Well, if we look back down the racetrack, we'll see those cars as they make their way, probably coming up to the chicane. And then into turn 15, the final turn on to pit straight as the, the left rear, not quite maybe as efficient in terms of the, the symmetry of getting these wheels and tyres done. So then they're starting to do the right hand side. And there are those cars making their way down and uh, I think the Mercedes, the Black Falcon car might well have lost out. I think you're right. So Wolfgang Reip is ahead of Bortolotti, but Frins has been the real winner after that inspired pit stop very early, but it got him out of traffic. And so there, through back markers, goes Wolfgang Reip huge challenge for him and he, yes he's done a few years of racing not as many as those around him but the former playstation academy winner thrown in at the deep end in as much as he gets into the car he's got to rejoin the race and defend effectively the race lead and battle against the cars all the way through the mercedes arena but he did a good job of doing so as in comes guy smith so the bentleys will pit on different laps that means that staying out for at least one more is max book yes and uh, obviously that's part of the team strategy they cannot bring the two cars in at one time so they do it one after the other, so Max Book is the second of the cars. The car that's leading ordinarily will get the choice as to when they come in, and that's why they brought the Guy Smith car in first. Max Book makes his way down the pit lane, and expect again from M Sport team, who run the Bentleys, to do a pretty impressive job and try and use this, as again we see with WRT so frequently, to get their vehicles ahead of the positions that they had been running on the racetrack. Now, the Emil Frey Jaguar has just come in and it's coasting down the pit lane. I think he couldn't find his pit box for some reason, but anyway, that car is in. The pit lane is getting busier because Smith is in, Engel is in. Lots and lots of cars now as they get to the end of the allowed time. Remember, it's 70 minutes for a stint uh, coming into the pit road. If a safety car's on track, you get five minutes grace, but it's 70 minutes at this point. Hot brakes on the seven Bentley. Certainly are. A lot of heat coming off those brakes. Yeah. Uh, the pad's getting really well cooked and you have to be careful when you go back out, just give the brake pedal a good dab or three. As we see Wolfgang right, but right at the tail. Being delayed in traffic, he's got the Attempto Porsche in the way, ooh, so ooh. Bortolotti's car tries to get up the inside, but Wolfgang right. He's certainly under big, big attack, isn't he? As they come off the final corner. Remember, before the pit stops, the Lamborghini was ahead. Over the timing line they come. Then now, right, then Bortolotti, then Frins. Here comes the Bentley, but he's going to lose places as it gets out of the pit lane. Down to turn one. Now to the inside. Looks Bortolotti in the Lamborghini. Couldn't do that. Well, Bortolotti was just left standing. The power of the Nissan off. Turn 15. Just nothing the Lamborghini could do. Wolfgang right break, maybe normal place. And I think Bortolotti thought, I'll have a bit of this because I can maybe slide down. Maybe, I think, the Lamborghini driver feeling that he can maybe have an opportunity under brakes into turn one. He sort of tested the water on that lap. Next time round, if he's in the position, he's going to be looking a little bit more seriously and taking a position away from the Nissan. But look how the Audi now is very definitely in the mix. Number one, which is Robin Frintz at the wheel. There is Guy Smith, Bentley number seven, as in comes Max Book. So we're almost at the end of the first round of pit stops now. Just looking at the times at number 173, written by Sean Walkinshaw, his last lap in the 137.57.5. So 
the pace of the car that was leading the race is a strong pace, certainly quicker than those cars that are directly ahead of him, including Wolfgang Reib, uh, the, the Lamborghini and the Audi. So Walkinshaw pushing and doing a good job to try and recoup and get back to a position, not of the lead, but to put himself into a position to challenge for the lead. Yeah, of course, those three cars all squabbling, holding each other up. Sean Walkinshaw with clear air catching up to them as we are on to lap number 35 now. There, look, is right, getting away once more from Bortolotti. Robin Friends very definitely in the mix now for the race honours. But as far as the championship is concerned, still a long way down the order and out of the points is the Ortelli Schnippler car. And that therefore means it's looking very good, keep your fingers crossed if you're a Nissan fan at the moment, for number 23. It leads effectively the race at the moment allowing for the pit stops to correct things. And there is 31, ready to rejoin the race. So Andy Merrick in number seven, back on track. Over the line goes now the race leader, Wolfgang Reip. Nine tenths up on Mirko Bortolotti, but in third place, Robin Frins, for a car that was nowhere in the first stint. You know, you have no, you know, you've got to trust what goes on in the pit lane. I hate to keep repeating it, but the race will be won or lost, ultimately, by the pace of the car on the track, but primarily what you get done on the pit stops. You've got one more round of pit stops to go, and I don't know whether WRT with the number one car can work a further oracle, but certainly they've brought that car from being out of the top ten right into contention for podium honours. So the roll of the dice has been a successful one. There it is in third place. There fourth is Sean Walkinshaw. In fifth place, look now behind as the cars work their way through is the first of the Bentleys, which is number seven. It's ahead in turn of the Mercedes, so uh, the Hubert Haupt car, now Yelma Berman at the wheel. That's lost out a little bit, hasn't it, on the first round of pit stops? Yeah, it just looked like the, 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 the method that the team used for how they take the tyres to and from the car, not to be as slick as we see from WRT or from the Bentley or from other teams in the pit lane, and it's that. You're practising it and big lumps of debris in the middle of the track and the exit of turn nine. Probably a big bit of bodywork, more likely a bit of rubber that's just bailed off from inside the car. You get a build-up of rubber inside, uh, and then it just suddenly drops off. So there's 63, Mirko Bortolotti, he had that bid to try to take over the race lead, it did not work. And so now he runs in second place, so the Nissan into the lead. Casamasa Chio points at the screen, Alex Buncan stands alongside him. Uh, 31, which is the Max Buch car is going to be another one to keep an eye to to see how that fares. Now, look at the Pro Cup standings of the race at the moment. The Nissan set, if things were to stay as they are, to score class honours in the championship, but with an hour and 47 minutes, there's an awful lot that can yet happen. Here come the leaders then, over the line, right leads in the Nissan, second is Portolotti in the Lamborghini, third, Robin Frins in the Audi, then in fourth place now, it's Sean Walkinshaw's Nissan, fifth is Andy Merrick in the Bentley, sixth is Yelma Berman's green Mercedes. Seventh is Maxim Soule in the second of the Bentleys. And then in eighth place, it should be there, the blue and white Santa Lock Audi of Miguel Molina. Ninth, Shane van Gisbergen. And number two Audi, Stefan Rochelmi at the wheel, has just gained a place, just got past Sean Thong in the Phoenix Audi. So that's going to bring him up to tenth in class now. And that means, for the first time, number two is starting to score points. And they need every single point. There is the pass down the inside through the back markers. Yeah, and that's a clean pass. And, I mean, the back marker just simply stayed over to the left of track to let the quicker car, the number two, Audi, and its quest to consolidate its championship lead. It needs something better than it's got. They can't rely on the 10th place. And board as we come down into turn six. And here we can see the amount of cars running off track. And that was better. Now, the number one Audi we've been getting excited about because the strategy to bring it in early has worked. It's up to third, and Lawrence Van Toren is awaiting his stint. He's with OJ. Apologies, we'll come back to the pit lane, hopefully. So we can't hear just yet from Ron's Vantor. We'll get back to it if we can as soon as. As there, the 50 Ferrari back into the race, having been in the gravel earlier, tries to keep out of the way of other cars that are a lap down and those on the lead lap, everybody fighting everybody else. Yeah, I mean, it's an, an unenviable situation to be in that you're, you're, you're one of the slower cars on the circuit, you've been off the track, you cause the yellow flag, the, the safety car, and you're being overly cautious and you're trying to not get in anybody's way. It's not the way to drive a race. Unfortunately, that's the situation the car and driver find themselves in. Over the timing line, 
There's number one Audi then, mired in traffic on this lap, but Robin Frins will be able to work her way by. As long as they can keep 70 minutes out of this next stint, they're going to be still good. I think to go to the end of the race, and there gets past the back marker. Yeah, I mean, Robin Frins was very cautious just coming down into turn one. Wasn't certain if the Mercedes was going to concede, but it stayed well to the left, and that was the indication that then the, the place, it wasn't a place for position, it was a place just to uh, an overtake. So uh, Robin Frins was being, being cautious, being rightly so particularly in a car that maybe he wasn't certain as to which of the drivers in that car is behind the wheel. 27, the Aston Martin of Salah Yorok being given a drive-through penalty for cutting the white line at pit exit. So that car, 27, new to the championship, the TF Sport, Tom Farrier's team at the Aston will be serving a drive-through. It's a long way down the order, I'm afraid, anyway. But you're looking here at what's going on in traffic as Sean Walkinshaw in fourth spot, tries to find a way round on the outside of the Mercedes. Oh, and there's contact! Yep, there's a little contact right front and uh, left front of the Mercedes, and I uh, don't think there's any particular damage, but it's that kind of contact that's so easy just to cut a tyre. But uh, I think that one he's gotten away with it, he doesn't need to be taking any more risks. So up the hill and into turn 10. And looks to be it's escaped any any yeah. damage certainly to this the tower would be my concern bodywork would be very very substance very light if there was any damage whatsoever the mercedes being driven by daniel alaman new to this type of racing but pretty experienced in porsche carrera cup deutschland but anyway getting in the way a bit short walking short committing to the outside and that little brush between them so wolfgang ripe is the race leader the number 23 nissan works its way up now to the end of lap 37. so wolfgang ripe comes across the start finish line complete lap 37 last lap 157.7 good pace from the race leader and sits behind the wheel of the nissan very comfortable has got clear air ahead of him doesn't have to make any compromises anywhere on the approach the entry the braking into turn one then clean exit gets the power on good traction from the nissan of course the nissan with that v6 twin turbo engine got loads of punch and one of the problems that nissan can suffer from is you spin up the rear wheels there's so much torque available You've got to be judicious with the throttle in these lower speed corners. Just balancing the car on the steering and on the throttle comes out of turn four, then the run down to turn five. Turn five is one of those corners you come in a little bit early, but you want to hug the curb as much as possible, not run so far wide because then it compromises your entry into six and consequently then slightly on your exit of turn six on the run down. And it's quite a quick run down in to turn seven for the race leader. Again, clear track there is a car ahead but not coming into play at the end of this lap he will be that little bit closer so we will have to think about where will i find a way through without compromising my lap time and i don't want to do that i don't want to give any advantage to the second place lamborghini only 2.2 seconds behind so where wolfgang Reif will actually overrun or run up to the back of the car ahead of him he can control that to some degree he will try and run it down as quickly as possible but he wants to do it and there will be a slightly awkward situation. He wants to do it going into the chicane, but the car is too far ahead. So he needs, in this instance, not to overrun into the chicane, which would then maybe put himself into an awkward position, but just balance the speed in that he runs close to the back of the car coming through turn 15. And from what I can see, he's doing it pretty well. Well, just got slightly caught. There's a Porsche, in fact. So fractionally losing momentum and uh, but should have enough straight line performance to put out past the Porsche down the hill down into turn one but the Porsche's got loads of squirt too and the Nissan not really making any yards but because the Nissan in the inside and is the race leader will be a wave blue flag to the Porsche to indicate a lead car coming through so good job by Wolfgang Raab right on lap 38. Jürgen Herring in the Porsche, there Jelma Berman gets past the Ian Loggy Audi and also looking to try to find a way by his 31 now, Maxime Soule, the Belgian driver at the wheel. And you've got the Mercedes there now, powering away, but Maxime Soule doing a pretty good job as the cars work their way through turn number three. But up front, the gap between second and third is coming down, the lead gap is going up, it's just over a second between now Bortolotti and Friends for that second and third place. Ripe is building the advantage up front. Yeah, strong drive by the German driver, the Belgian driver, in fact, Wolfgang Ripe. And the second, third uh, places are pretty much nose to tail. Walken Shaw in the former leading Nissan in fourth place has now got the gap to third to fourth, down to under two seconds. So he's making 
marginal progress lap upon lap and as the second and third place cars are having their independent battle and there is the battle further down through the field so Walker Shaw is able to use that and he will want to get himself as soon as possible onto the tail of this battle that we're looking at now which is between Yama Perman in the Mercedes and behind him Maxim Sule. So this is for sixth and seventh places. Sean Walkinshaw up the road fourth, Andy Merrick up the road fifth, and then this for sixth, Mercedes versus Bentley. Two fine brands by name with long, long motorsport pedigrees. And up towards the chicane they will come. Is Sule going to be able to have a go at Berman? There, look, Robin Frins. That car, very definitely in contention now, where it will slot in after the second round of stops will be fascinating as Fritz works his way through traffic, but that early decision to pit, get him out of the traffic, has worked wonders over the timing line it comes. We had a go at hearing from uh, Laurence Van Tour earlier, and so here's what we prepared earlier. We can hear this time from the Belgian with OJ. Yeah, hopefully we'll have better luck this time and you can hear me. Three things to endurance racing, the car, the driver, and a great strategy, and that was a great stop. Yeah, actually, we for a safety car because it was like a pretty dangerous uh, situation so uh, but in the end there was no safety car but the, we know one of our strongest points is the guys are extremely quick in the pit stops we saw that last weekend in Portimao uh, and they did a fantastic pit stop Robin had a free free laps in the beginning and we could make up some some ground so. but stopping that early does that have ramifications for later in the race will that set you back uh, it should be but in this case, I have the impression that we're not as strong as the others in the beginning of the stint, on new tyres. But uh, the longer we drive, uh, the closer we get to them. Uh, so I think our degradation is a bit less. But we will see. Uh, yeah, Robin is still plus minus half an hour to go for me to jump in. Uh, in a good position, but let's see. Thank you very much. So we'll see where the car slots in at the end of the second round of stops, but it's up there now on merit, on pace and the lap times comparable to those that it's running with. In fact, last time around, it was just 5,000 quicker on a lap time than the Lamborghini there that works its way up through traffic, gets itself ahead of the Santa Lock Audi number 36. And now the Audi pounces on the back marker. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, Robin Friens is always that little bit more cautious on the commitment to an overtake when it's particularly close, like a, one of the slower Audis or one of the other, you know, the, the Pro-Am or Am cars, never, quite certain as to what that car is going to do where some of his teammates are clearly more naturally aggressive and they would just they would make the decision for the lap car but Robin Friens just you know, playing a cautious game he knows he wants to hand his car over to Lawrence Van for for that final stint and he does not want to have unnecessary contact and therefore potential pit stop or penalty for uh, a, a, a driver error another car that pitted early was the Von Ryan 58 orange McLaren that is in ninth place it's not really yet part of that leading group, as there through the traffic goes the fifth-placed Andy Merrick Bentley. But Shane Van Gisbergen, and of course, learning another new circuit, is 22 seconds adrift of the race leader. Not out of the hunt completely. Never know what might yet happen with 96 minutes still to go. Sean Walkinshaw, though, is closing on Fritz, so second, third and fourth bunching up. The incident that involved car number 12 from earlier on, the... TDS Racing BMW, no further action taken against that, so we are told from race control. But there, number one Audi, working its way out of turns five and six, ready to plunge downhill, and Sean Walkinshaw giving a very good account of himself in fourth. Yes, he's had a reasonably good run and relatively clear air, other than having to come up against some of the back markers, but he has closed the gap. There was about a three-second gap when he got behind the wheel on his first opening lap to now just fractionally over a second, and now he's in that zone where he can really sense, I can now put a bit of pressure on this Audi in third place. I can make Robin Free and start to look behind himself as well as trying to, as he's doing right now, and look forward. And in fact, Michael Pott, the, the Lamborghini, has managed to, to pull a, you know, maybe a couple of car lengths from Robin Free as they're on now, lap 43. Berko Borton lost his lap time. Last lap round was over a second slower than Wolfgang Wright, who is now getting on up the road. So. Winner at Paul Ricard for six hours. What can it do in a three-hour race here? And at the moment, it's not only doing great things in the race, but also for the championship. Whereas number two, Stefan Rochelle, we need to perhaps look at because he's in tenth place. Bad for points, but what progress from there can be made? He's got to find another 17 and a bit seconds before he can attack anybody else. Bortolotti getting away. Now, Frins under attack from Walkinshaw. Yes. And remember the Lieutenant Lawrence Van Force saying talking about top speed. Uh, we've got to know that the uh, Nissan has got really, really powerful straight-line speed. 
And a strong defence, Robert Frames. But look, Walkinshaw dives on, immediately swaps back, dives on the outside. Now can he make the undercut as the Audi runs slightly wide? Now trying to go around the outside of turn two into three, normally ends up in tears. So Walkinshaw pulls back into line and follows the Audi through into the tightening apex of turn three. But the message is clear that uh, the Nissan is on a charge. So Nissan leading, charging away. And Nissan in fourth place trying to get back to the front where it dominated once this race started. And in fairness to Sean Walkinshaw, he's not gone this well all season. We're seeing the best of him as a GT racer and a great effort. And remember Martin Plowman to take over the car, another very, very quick driver as well. So it's still looking good for a good result, this. Could it be a podium finish come the very end? Well, I think a lot of this confidence is coming from the preparation and the engineering that's going into the uh, always evolving motorsport Nissan. And once a driver has confidence, he can do anything behind the wheel. And Sean is less experienced than the co-drivers that he is racing with, but certainly showing and runs fractionally wide. That's just the aero effect, the air getting off the nose of the Nissan coming up through turns eight and nine. Again, the power of the Nissan on that uphill incline, almost getting him alongside the Audi, the V10, naturally aspirated Audi against the 3.5 litre V6 twin, twin turbocharged Nissan. So for third and fourth, Robin Fritz with a great single seater pedigree before he came into GT racing, tries to fend off Sean Walkinshaw on the way up the hill, but the Nissan looks for the inside. Fritz, a relative newcomer to GT racing. Walkinshaw, a relative newcomer to GT racing. They've done lots of miles over the course of the year. And look, they're being caught by an old hand at this sports car racing mark. Andy Merrick in the Bentley is getting up and up and up with them because it's almost now three of them together for third place. And in fact, it's going to be four of them yes. together yes. because the second Bentley now also wanting to join into this battle for third place. Make it five because you've got the Mercedes there as well. Walkinshaw has a look, big lock up from Merrick, hunting them down. Need to start thinking about the Bentley in Championship, don't we? You yeah, so. need to be careful with that lockup. If you get a flat spot on tyre, or you flat spot it sufficiently, then you're going to be forced into the pits. The vibration that will come from that heavily flat spot on tyre, it would just be virtually impossible to drive. Andy Merrick just makes his way out of turn four, and uh, he's got a sight on the rear of the Nissan, as Walkinshaw's got a sight on the rear of the ID. And Robert Friens is wondering, what have I got to do? to try and put that challenge on second place. And I was doing that successfully, but the Lamborghini kind of escaped the, the clutches of the ID yeah, and uh, has fallen back into the Walkinshaw's awaiting arms for that third place. Yeah, it's only a couple of seconds between Bortolotti and Fritz, but it has opened up, as you say. There is Walkinshaw now on the back of the Audi, which is on less fresh tyres by dint of stopping early. So are we now to the point where the tyres are having an effect against the Audi? Well, again, going back to Lawrence Van Four, he said he thought that the Audi worked better towards the end of the stint when the tyres were less, there was less degradation. Some of the, some of the other cars, you know, their weight, their weight distribution, the aero effect uh, might use the tyre more. So the, the Audi has done more laps on its current set of tyres than those three that are pursuing it. In the AM Cup, Carrie Moje is the category leader at the moment from Anthony Pons Ferrari in Jürgen Herring's Porsche. And there is the leading and BMW, it's the middle of those three. It's the black and orange car. Remember, it had its big accident at Spa, but Carrie Moje, class winner at Silverstone, leading the way here as well as they come over the line. Ferrari tucked up behind to try to make the move. That's out of the Pro-Am category as they drop down towards Turn 1. And the Francisco Guedes car is allowed by. There's no point fighting that. No, I mean, I'm just thinking back to Spa. That was one almighty accident, and yeah. there's still a bit of damage on the left front of the, the BMW. A little bit of the, the air deflectors looking like they've slightly been deflected themselves. There's the battle, and right on the gearbox of the under the rear wing, and also the Bentley doing the same thing. So Andy Merrick not shy and putting his foot in the door and trying to force an issue. And this time Scott threw the Audi's drop back one place. And it could lose another, couldn't it? Because Merrick has arrived on the scene as well. So the Audi in this stint potentially wilting, but they've got to get him for at least another at least another 20 minutes before they can think about a pit stop. So Robin Frintz now goes into damage limitation mode. He's got to defend, but Walkinshaw is away up the road, and Frintz making that Audi very wide indeed now. Yes, and uh, we did, I think that pass occurred in turn one, but uh, we've now got to see whether the, the Nissan in third place can do anything about Bortolotti in the second place Lamborghini. Once he's been released from the rear of the Audi, then you can see how much he's been able to pull away, and he's got. you can see the lime green Lamborghini as it goes into turn seven, the Lamborghini exits it, and... Uh, so the Bentley is uh, 
doing its work, preparing to look for an opportunity again, probably most likely to turn one. There's the dime. I mean, just Sean Walkinshaw just took a punt, went down the inside. Robin Freens decided that, you know, I'm, I want to finish this race. We've got one more pit stop to go. We can regain probably our position in the pit stop, so don't let's cause any damage to the car. And there, Andy Merrick, he's feeling a bit feisty. He thinks, I want to get alongside that Audi. Once I can do that, I can get ahead, and then I can put further heat onto the rear of the third place at uh, Nissa. So that's what's happening at the moment. So Sean Walkinshaw driving the race of his life up into third place. And there is Friends now having to defend from both Bentleys. Merrick and then Sule tucked up behind him. Number seven is Smith. Is, uh, sorry, Merrick in the car that Guy Smith started, I should say. And then 31 is Maxim Sule having taken over from Max Book. And actually 31 at the moment looking the quicker. It's clawed its way onto the back of the sister car. Very much so. And I've got to say, Maxim Sule is probably going to be doing what we saw Guy Smith do much earlier in the race. That's getting used to oh, headlights going. But. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Andy America is somebody who's in nature is inclined to give way unless there's an instruction. We heard Malcolm Wilson would have no hesitation whatsoever. Stephen Kane keeps an eye on what's going on in that car. He's got no hesitation whatsoever in saying one or another driver can seed the other cars quicker. I mean, Sule using the inside of the curb again and three gets it. You can see them. There's pace off turn four, fractionally quicker than that of Andy Merrick. So whatever the differences are in the handling of the cars, or just simply maybe slightly better rubber for the Maxim Sule car, it gives it that little bit of an edge on the exit of these corners. Downhill they go once again, lap 45, just about at the halfway point, with now an hour and 28 minutes remaining as they turn their way through the Dunlop curve. And you can see how Robin Frintz is falling away from Sean Walkinshaw, but is Walkinshaw going to be able to close now on Bortolotti? Vincent Voss nearest the camera, Pierre Giudone with the other headset on. Looking on, they are the brains behind the WRT squad. But if you're liking seeing Frintz drop away. No, but I have to say, concern written across the face of Voss and Giudone because that uh, letting the Walkinshaw Nissan get through Maybe relatively easily, and I think the reason Robin Friend is in it is because he thought, I'd rather let the pace go and let's rely on our pit stops. But ultimately, leaving a position for another car, a competitive car, to take your position in relatively easy ways, maybe the team just think that that was given up a bit too easily. Yeah, Robin came into GT racing, didn't he, with this great track record from junior single-seater racing. The career stalled because of lack of money. He had a pretty horrible baptism with his accident at Nagaro that uh, meant the car couldn't race there after qualifying incidents. But he has got on with the job of being a GT gun driver this year. But, yeah, you're right, it did make uh, Sean Walkinshaw's life a bit easier, that pass going down to the first corner. So now, for instance, defends from Andy Merrick, and they work their way up towards the... Turn two, turn three sequence with both Bentleys stuck behind the Audi and the clock ticks away, but there's still another 26 minutes till you get to the hour mark, so 16 really before they can think about a pit stop. Now, if things stay as they are, Buncombe, Chio and Wright would be Pro Cup champions. Ortelli and Stippler would be second and Kane and Smith and Merrick would bag third if things stay as they are. But there's another hour and 26, so things are likely to shuffle, that's for certain but the way that the number 23 Nissan is going, it leads the race and it leads Pro Cup in the championship. And the number two Audi is the one that's really struggling to make any progress at all. But a car that is making good progress, Black Falcon, Mercedes-Benz, Elmer Barman in it. Seventh place, currently 2.7 seconds behind sixth place. And he is lapping at the minute, probably about three to four tenths of a second bigger than these cars here. These are the cars that are all battling over second, third, fourth positions. So out through the traffic comes Robin Friends, and there, making a move, Andy Merrick trying to use the traffic to his advantage, but he's going to get stuck behind the Ferrari, he has to give way, he arrives very, very quickly at the next S, and Maxim Sule is in with a chance of getting by, but backs out of it as well, so Robin Friends hangs onto the place, Merrick thought he had a chance, then found traffic in the way. Yeah, he pulled out and went to the wrong side and found another car, a slower car, so had to quickly make the switch back. And uh, in the process, almost allowed his own teammate, Maxime Sule. Sule looks to go up to the inside, but he has to pull back into the line. He was nowhere near it in the position to take that uh, position away from American fifth place. And friends look up the curb as he tries to get past the Barwell Team Russia BMW. Up towards the timing line they come. And friends 
as you see second side by side over the line it's walking sure on the outside of Bortolotti he had his nose in front when they went over the timing line but the Lamborghini's got the inside line for turn one Sean walking short tries to stand his ground on the outside can't do it has to give way but the pace of the Nissan is there and Sean walking short driving the race of his life yeah he, he could have been a little bit more thoughtful and try to you know, allow Bortolotti to run slightly deeper and trying to make the cutback but you know we're sitting here in the commentary booth that Sean Walcott you're driving blinding race he thought he could you know, bully it out by going around the outside and then be in position in the right position to be ahead of the Lamborghini in turn two Prince through the traffic as well is he going to be able to put a back mark between himself and Andy Merrick as they go downhill there looking at the back of Sean Walkinshaw's Nissan he's been briefly ahead of the Lamborghini when they went over the timing line he had his nose in front by 54 thousandths of a second in the background Yelma Berman still working his way up through traffic he's got past the Team Russia BMW as well now as the cars work their way through the Schumacher S it's a 6.6 second gap between first and second of course then third place right on the gearbox of the second place Lamborghini so Sean Walcott show you know there's maybe only one place on the circuit where he might be able to think I've got a really good clear chance of getting ahead of the Lamborghini and most likely that's going to be it there to pitch straight into turn one had a go did it they tried to go the long way around into that corner but Bertolotti was deep into the corner and forced the Nissan to keep going wider 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 and then the advantage returned to the Lamborghini. But if they squabble, that's going to bring Robin Frintz back into the mix, isn't it? They're going to hold each other up, and Frintz and Merrick and Sule, and to a lesser degree, Berman, might get up there as well. So depends really how long that scrap's going to rage on for. Here they come again up over the line, walking short, not close enough this time to have a go at the end of the straight. But now, as the turbo power kicks in, will he get close enough come the end? Let's see. No, not this time around. So starting that 48, order is the same. And there, Robin Frintz is 1.6 seconds back. Well, the, the pace of the Lamborghini, as we saw in the early phases of the race, is actually drawing fourth, fifth, sixth pace up to the back of the Nissan, and that's what's going to be, I suspect, in another five laps of the situation. We've got a five cars ultimately battling for what is currently third place, or second and third place. Sule, a good exit coming out of turn four. Look, lights and goes to go down the inside. Now, is this going to be ground conceded and I think yes it is and I think this time it was decided that uh, the pace of Andy Sule uh, Maxime Sule not his brother Andy sorry that's Andy Suche so pass between the two Bentleys we saw that happen in the first hour when Guy Smith found his way around Max, uh, Max Book so again the two Bentley drivers cooperating as a team and now we'll see what they can do in the reverse order in other words, Sule ahead about Robin Frintz as up through the chicane there. And the Schumacher S comes, Bortolotti, Sean Walkinshaw hunting him down once again. And Robin Frintz trying to stay with them, but the Audi just dropping away a little bit. Wolfgang Wright leading Dolby Esque in a sense by 7.2 seconds now. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's gone up over the yeah. last lap. So that's what I'm saying is that the Lamborghini is actually holding up this battle that's going to concertina in the next few laps again. I think maybe some of that right time last was due to the traffic, but now the, the Lamborghini's going to have to contend with them. It's not just a single car, it's two cars. This will give Walkenshaw primarily an opportunity that he's been waiting for, because unless the Lamborghini can get through cleanly here, then it's going to be about getting a good run off the final turn for the, the Nissan, which is what Walkenshaw will have been preparing for, because the Lamborghini is concerned about where am I going to get past these two back markers? And in the meantime, the, the Nissan should be powering all the way down the street. Again, a fairly aggressive move from the Lamborghini. Traffic will be the outcome of this battle for second place. Through the Mercedes arena they come. Bortolotti to the inside, and the back marker spins, and thankfully they both missed the number three Audi, but walking sure is delayed as a consequence. Now, it was that contact. It looked to me like it could have been contact. There was no obvious reason for the Audi just suddenly to lose it was only driving its own race but there we see the Lamborghini no obvious signs of contact but it only had to be in a very very light lean on the the left rear corner for the Audi to lose traction fortunately it didn't catch the, the Nissan which went to the right hand side of the spinning Audi as it went from left to right across the track so let's see if we can see was there any contact I would like to think there was. I mean, it was, it's very difficult to tell. And Walkinshaw did a good job because the, the Audi was going to go from left to right on the racetrack. 
and he gave enough space to avoid any contact, but in doing so, again, he had to concede a little bit of track position. Here we are, back to... But his delay has brought Frintz closer yeah. once he gets past Carrie Boje. So Walkinshaw has lost time, not only to the Lamborghini, but relative to Robin Frintz. Look, who's about to get up the inside and trying to go with him is Maxim Soule. Up the curb goes the Bentley, they get past Carrie Moje. And that incident between the Lamborghini and the Audi under investigation. Yep, I think that you'll find there was fractional contact and that's why the Audi was spun around. Whether that means a drive-through penalty or it might be seen as a racing incident, but bearing in mind what we saw with the Nicky Bastian incident with Alvaro Perez, I think that could easily be a drive-through penalty for the second-place Lamborghini. And that will be a bitter pill, having done a pretty good job yeah. defending that second position. Bortolotti, of course, was the man that started on pole position, so the cars had good pace. And there's another incident that's under investigation as well, which is Stefan Rochelmi, and also car 30, which is the uh, Pro Cup, sorry, Pro Am, I should say, Ferrari. So. Another Audi in strife, number two, which is still struggling in 10th place, now has this Damocletian investigation. Can't be very long before Robin Friens is going to be getting instructions to come into the pits, because they stopped around about 40 minutes, I think, when they made that initial pit stop. It was a very early stop, just around the time of that safety car intervention, so it's coming to the end of the stint. One minute, eight, one hour, 18 to go. They've got at least eight minutes they need to stay out for, because then they'll be on target with 70 minutes to the end, and 70 minutes is the maximum you can do, so they need to get through at least eight more minutes. Well, hopefully they will have the fuel on board. It's just a question as to what the condition of the tyres are and uh, the pace that Robin Friens is able to maintain. And the Merrick running very wide. That's the second time yeah. in a couple of laps we've seen Andy getting the rear wheel dropping off the kerb and kicking up a load of dust and sand. See sawing backwards and forwards, obviously under brakes. The gap closes, but then on the acceleration off the corner, it opens back up again, and Merrick having to battle his way past one of the BMWs in the AM category up the hill. He runs the kerb. And, uh, so Maxim Sule, again, having gotten ahead of the sister Bentley, hasn't really been able to do anything with the, the car that he wanted to get to. Interestingly, possibly because of traffic, Wolfgang Reib's last lap was a two minutes, one and a half, and Mirko Bortolotti a 1.59.3, so the gap has come down markedly to 3.3 seconds, and quite a lot of other drivers now doing two-minute laps in that leading group. Yeah, it's all about traffic, just catching the traffic at the wrong part of the racetrack, and again, you, 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 if you want to be foolhardy about it, you can take a chance, and the chances are if you have contact, then you'll do damage to your car. You may suffer a penalty, or a drive-through, or a, a time-added penalty, so it is a matter of balancing caution with... You know, some drivers are also inherently better in managing traffic than others are. Friends under attack from Sule now, fourth and fifth. Heading into turn one. And Robin Friends perhaps not really enjoying this didn't very much. He's lost track position. He's not fallen away in the end too much from Sean walking sure, but the car in fourth place has lost out relative to where it was at the start of the stint. And Maxim Sule fifth, Andy Merrick there in sixth place, and Sean Walkinshaw still looking for a way past that Lamborghini. Half a second between them, there's been a big accident there, that I think is the HTP Bentley that's come to grief coming out of that's turn a, six. It yeah. is Harold Primat's last ever race, he was going to call time on his career, has been called early, and it, there's debris all over the place. Yeah, he's hit the barrier heavily on the right-hand side of the screen, left-hand side coming down the hill, and it's spewed, look at the bodywork, I mean, yeah. whatever caused the car to hit the barrier there, I've never seen anything but that will be a safety car because there's masses of bodywork fortunately Harold Primat is out of the car damage also to the barrier but that was a massive hit and why it's difficult to tell and so now concerned faces at HTP but also other teams will be on their toes now trying to set guess what the race director is likely to do well I just wonder whether that will be, I mean the car's got to be removed the debris on the grass is less important but it would ideally be removed double wave yellow flags down on the exit of turn six. I would like to know how the Bentley got yeah. to hit the barrier there, because other than maybe riding the curb and the car really snatching and turning sharp left. Friends is ahead of walking short, but a yellow flag at that corner. Let's hope he did the move earlier. But the safety car is deployed. The safety car is being deployed, and walking short has lost out to Robin Friends. Now, let's hope that was before any yellow flag zone, but certainly the change has happened. And interesting, I, mean, I, I would have been surprised that on pace, the Audi would have gone past the Nissan, and all I can say is that you are required to slow down going through these waved yellow flag zones, and it just could be at the point when the, uh, there's the safety car about to be deployed.
So it may well be that Robert Frins will have to return that position to the Walker Show Nissan. I'd like to see what was and where on the track. It will certainly, if it was a pass under a yellow flag, that would be a major penalty to the number one ID. So, safety car on track. The lead that Wolfgang Reip has is 8.4 seconds now because of back markers. And the cars go over the line with Reip ahead of Bortolotti, Frins third, fourth Walkinshaw, fifth Zule, sixth Merrick, seventh Berman, eighth Miguel Molina, the DTM Audi driver, having his GT first outing, ninth is Van Gisbergen, and tenth is Stefan Rochelmi. Nobody bailing early because if they do, they're going to be the wrong side of the maximum 70 minutes for the final stint for a driver. So they need to go a little bit further before they can pit. The safety car might help some, but I reckon it's come a bit early for others. So the yellow flags wave, and it might even be a moderately lengthy time, this, because if there's barrier damage, that will need addressing. Yeah, I mean, the, where the barrier is, it's not in what I would call a critical part of the racetrack, but a race car's gone off on a part of the racetrack that I consider not to be critical, so it may well be that the barrier needs to be repaired. There's certainly a lot of bodywork on the grass and a substantial amount of it also on the racetrack. That needs to be cleared. Now, let's look and see... There, there's the car coming. Oh, he's off. He hits. He got a hit from behind, didn't he? I'm not sure he got hit from behind. Certainly he went. There you can see the bodywork shredding itself and shedding itself into the middle of the track. So whether that was a contact on the exit of turn six or whether that was just running slightly wide and the back end of the Bentley just went too wide and the car then snatched back and it just simply had no chance. And once it's on the grass, the grass is saturated here and now. Uh, it was off into the the barrier and nothing that uh, could be done to save it. So there is what's left of the Bentley. It was a big, big hit, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, the, the, the shock that goes through the entire front of the car, I mean, the, the, the chassis that, that, that holds the engine in position, the chassis legs, the deformable structures that are a part of that will all be, I think, fairly heavily damaged. And even, though no, we're just going back to the accident that we saw last night in practice, when Matt Griffin was punted off the back of his Ferrari, the car that has won the, the Pro-Am Championship, they had to replace the entire rear of the chassis as well as the suspension. Let's see if we can see, get a clear view as to what did occur. And, of course, the replay comes on. Uh, I don't know whether he was touched or not. Or it's strange. He looked to me to be sufficiently out of the corner. And then the car just appeared to turn left. It didn't appear that that Mercedes came into contact, but because it's so far away, it's a difficult. Now you can see the sad remains of the, what was the front of the Bentley. It made us all bodywork and carbon fibre, but there will be heavy damage to the run, the run, the radiators, and parts of the engine even can. There was very sudden impacts. Shock loading goes through. So still under safety car as we go on to lap 53. So our second safety car period of the race, and uh, Wolfgang Wright, the race leader, of course, these cars still trying to play catch-up, so the safety car scrambled and therefore didn't pick up the leader, but you saw it with the green light on the roof, that means it's OK to pass, and so cars are allowed through until it's the leader that is behind, and then the order is restored. So the safety car on track. field working its way downhill towards turn one so the leader shortly will be picked up behind the safety car there it is the safety car is picked up both going right and uh, that's up at turn 14 and he's waved him through oh well that's curious yeah got waved the, the leader has been waved through by the safety car the safety car now running behind the race leader I, I mean what, I, I don't really understand now it's got the number two position car the Lamborghini and it's remaining behind so why would they have waved the Lamborghini the, the Nissan through it's, I think we might have to get uh, OJ down to the old yeah. Nissan pits and work that one out so there so the green is. light flashes look and if the green light's on you can go past and he waves him through yeah I think it's an error from the team in the safety car, but it'll need addressing somehow. The easiest thing is to ask the Nissan team to get the driver to back off, isn't it? But that's not necessarily going to happen. I suspect there's pandemonium right now trying to get this sorted out, but um, it was, I've never seen that before, where no. the race leader is way through by the safety car, and the safety car then picks up what is well, the second car. Now the lights are out on top of the safety car. So where, where is the lead car? Clearly something not right here. 
the lights aren't even flashing anymore. So consternation all round for the safety car team. Well, consternation for the pit lane, particularly for second, third, fourth, yeah, fifth, yeah. and whatever. Well, now they've got the lights back on, but there's going to be some grumpiness from those in second and downwards because if the Nissan is allowed a free lap, oh. well, then that's job done. Yeah. But I mean, what a way to win a race. So all the others now head down the pit lane, or many of the others, to try and gain on this safety car period. And there is a rather bemused Wolfgang Wright. Now, as he's slowing down to allow the safety car to retake. I mean, I, I think Wolfgang Wright has just slowed right down. He's the safety the... car must be about to overtake, and then he can slot. There it is. There it is. Good. Like, oh, no, oh, he's lost he's the lead lost, now. He's lost the lead. I can't believe it. He's lost no, second he's as well. Oh, no, for heaven's he, sake. No, he's gone over that. OK, it's all been resolved. And, oh, dear me, what a... What wow. a... What a... What can you say? Human error. I suppose that you have to say things sometimes happen, but it's been... Re it's, been it's been rectified, and it's always good to see the, the correct outcome being restored, and it has been restored. So Wolfgang Reib, who was probably totally confused, totally confused by what was going on, is uh, back where he should be. Right, all right. So we've got 68 minutes to go. If you do a pit stop now, you're OK to go to the end because you're within the 70 minutes drive time. So expect, yep, yeah, leader in, second in, and now the safety car is going to pick up anybody it can find. Well, if anybody can catch the safety car before the safety car light goes out, be quite a, because there's, oh, there you can see the cars that are now, they're probably about a couple of seconds behind. Yeah. And they will be on the tail of the safety car, but that's kind of they get done so, to the end of the pit straight. Staying out, number 31, Maxim Sule leads the race now. Pro Tem ahead of Yelma Berman. Ian Loggy comes in, and there at the end of the pit lane, the Audi teams ready for numbers one and two. So it's, it's going to be a very, very crowded pit lane, isn't it? It's going to be, it's, once you get into your pits, that's one thing. But it's getting out there's the lead Nissan. It's it's so this is going to be the pit stop that will win or lose the race for the number one car. WRT who are outstanding in their pit stops, driver changes, refueling. As we saw the Nissan. So can we see the Nissan get turned around and get back out there? Is Alex Buncombe in the car, Wolfgang Reib helping with the belts? But I think that the WRT RD and again you see. Those cars that came in that earliest opportunity are all filtering their yeah. way back down. There's the Nissan. So now the right side there is the idea about to come on. The idea, I think, is ahead in terms of the pit stop. So the, the, the angle the Nissan is in, it's making it very tight. Even the angle of the Audi is in, it makes it very tight to change the right hand side tires. The Nissan's got to be pushed back, and it comes out. Oh! Stays well, ahead, but only just. That, I mean, that was released. And where was the Audi? Still. Well, significantly, the Bentley's ahead of the Lamborghini. There's the Audi coming out. But the Bentley has gained on the pit stop, so that's gained up one spot. The Audi falls to fourth on the release, but Bentley number seven is the winner on that. It's got ahead of the Lamborghini. So remember that that car had dropped not only behind the Lamborghini and the Audi, but the other Bentley. It's really bought in at the end of that pit stop, hasn't it? It certainly has. Good work by the Bentley boys. No, a good pit stop, they got in and out. And is this little, is, who's behind the wheel? Is it now Stephen Kane? Should be, yeah. Oh, he's the man. Absolutely, he's so he's the in the man. box seat, isn't he? Stephen Kane, when it comes to putting the hammer down, when it last stint at Silverstone last year. Absolutely. Other events, I mean, I called him a little terrier on the track interview, and he knows how to battle and work a car to get it to his advantage. So Kane, Buncombe, Babini, Van Tour, all the stars, as we are going to go green then, and those that haven't pitted are going to lose out, I'm afraid, by pitting after the safety car period, because they will lose more time relative to the opposition on the pit stop. So Sule's Bentley and Berman's Mercedes here are about to be compromised, but they stay out and they battle for race leadership, but when they pit, they're going to lose quite a lot of time because they will be pitting under live conditions, not safety car conditions. Sule trying to repel Yelma Berman, former single-seater star, the safety car is coming down the pit lane with another wave behind it. And they're being delayed as they head down the pit road as well. So those that didn't pit are being compromised. And also Berman's being compromised because he's stuck behind the Bentley. Yeah, well, Yama Berman has been on this stint very quick all the way through. But there is the, the Nissan back out on track. And we need a lap or two to wash this all through to see what are the relative positions. We think it's still a Nissan technically leading the race. 
That's the yeah. uh, beginning, and uh, the Audi Morgan Shaw with Martin Plumman now behind the wheel. It's dropped back to... Well, it's all going through this whole cycle, so it's somewhat irrelevant, but not maybe... The, I don't know where the Bentley found that time in the pit stop, but whatever it did, they got through. The only thing I can think of is the Audi was pretty tight in to the pit box, and that could slow down that whole process, just simply because he had no more space. And Vantor is a man on a mission, look, he's right on the back of Fabio Babini now as they come down to turn one. The 63 Lamborghini, apologies, Mercat Venturini at the wheel of it as they turn their way through turn one, so Venturini hangs onto the place briefly. Vantor tries the outside, and now to turn three, Giovanni Venturini then under real attack, the Audi tries to get to the inside line. Both cars out of the Audi group. And certainly there's a bit of commonality between the R8s and the Huracan, but Vantor absolutely charging. And Venturini's going to have to work really hard now to keep him at bay. Yeah, well, Vantor wants to get through at the earliest chance. He doesn't want to be stuck behind a similarly parked car. We know that the Lamborghini has got good straight-line speed. We know that the Audi fractionally more draggy in terms of its body and downforce. So it will be a battle for Lawrence Vantor to make this pass early. He does not want to spend more than a lap. He'll lose his momentum. The whole familiar story that we know of getting caught behind another car, which you are capable of lapping quicker than, but you can't find a way around. So uphill comes 63. The green Lamborghini, just for the moment at least, being able to fend off the challenge of Laurence Vantor. Giovanni Venturini at the wheel of what is traditionally the second of the two Lamborghinis, but it's really shone today, and it works its way now through the... Bill Stein curved to the inside, looks to Lawrence Van Tour, but he can't make that move stick. And how are they getting on relative to Bentley and Nissan up the road? They're certainly falling back because they're busy squabbling into the Avant Bogen. They come now through that fast right up the hill, heading towards the chicane. So Lawrence Van Tour had his chance, and now that they've been a couple of laps into this race, he really is not able to do anything with the Lamborghini. It's going to take a mistake or it's going to take traffic, but right now, the Audi's got nothing for the Lamborghini. There's another incident under investigation. It involves Harold Primer and number 99, the Dusseldorp Junkadea Bastian Mercedes. We wondered if there was contact. That's part of the answer, and it's that Mercedes again, seemingly in the wars. But who was behind the wheel? Was that Dusseldorp behind the yes. wheel? It was. Yeah. It's difficult to tell that long range camera shot. We couldn't see. We were seeing the cars in that head on position. We couldn't tell if there had been rear contact, but obviously there's something that the stewards do want to investigate, rightly so. And again, if there has been incident, then there's going to be another penalty to 99, and uh, that was a heavy incident for the 84 Bentley, and taken it out of the race and done probably about £100,000 worth of damage, and that's probably a minimum amount. Indeed so, as the leading cars then dive through the traffic, there is Danny Junkadea in the 99 investigated Mercedes, and... There, getting stuck in the traffic is Yelma Berman, but he has got through now. He leads on track ahead of Maxim Sule, so the Mercedes leads for the moment. He's got another pit stop to make. Maxim Sule, they're down in second place. So Mercedes leads in Germany. Bentley second as they come over the timing line. Down towards turn one, traffic all around. There's just no room really for Sule to make a move here as they get into the braking zone for the corner. And then the Mercedes even continues to try and make progress goes wrong. The long way around the outside gets himself in position, out of position. Bentley up the inside now of Yelmo Berman. Berman on the outside being forced wide. And of course, the BMW now is forcing again the Mercedes to lose even more ground. Three wide going into turn four it will not work. So they shuffle themselves back into some sort of order, but Maxim Sule then retakes the lead and has gapped, has he not, the Mercedes now? Yes, he has. And also the 99 Mercedes has gotten ahead of, of uh, the uh, Yelmo Berman car caused by traffic coming through turns two and turn three. Berman opted to go the long way round and got really wrong-footed by the BMW, which was caught in no man's land. Not his fault, just happened to be in the wrong place. Now, after all those pit stops, the car to watch is 58, because Kevin Est has made two pit stops, and that car is ahead of the Alex Buncombe Nissan. So the Von Ryan McLaren, remember, that pitted very, very early in the first stint, after the second stop, is now ahead of the Alex Buncombe Nissan, so the orange McLaren is in fourth place, it's done its two pit stops, and that, therefore, for the moment, is in a very, very, very good position. That's not the story of the moment. The story <laughs> of the moment is Stephen Kane in seventh place, fastest first and third sectors, a 1 minute 55.9. Fastest lap of the race. Wow! But he's still effectively third. This, then, is the car 
that is the notional race leader. So as soon as the next stops have cycled through, then it is going to be in the box seat because the two pit stops are done and it's the leading two stopping car then. So Kevin Ash at the wheel of the McLaren and what sort of advantage has he got over Alex Bunker? Let's wait and see. Look at all that empty track, a yawning, yawning gap before the Nissan there arrives. So Alex Bunker is still on for a good result, but can he catch the McLaren before the very end? Well, can the McLaren maintain its pace until the very end? That's the other question. So Nissan, the later of the stoppers, will have slightly fresher tyres all the way through. There's the Lamborghini and the Audi Lawrence Van Thorpe still unable, with all his speed and skill, unable to find a way past the Lamborghini. And same old story on a circuit like Nürburgring, the chances to overtake are few and far between. And if you sit behind a car, you're going to be controlled by that car's pace. The result, potentially, second for the Nissan would still be enough for the Pro Cup honours. But the 58 Kevin S. McLaren then, which did its personal best lap last time, a 56-7, is the leader. There is Lawrence Vantor, still frustrated behind Giovanni uh, Venturini as they work their way up out of the Coca-Cola curve over the timing line now. Leaders go through, staying out. Maxime Soule, the leader, 2.4 seconds up on Yelma Berman. But there is Kevin Est, fourth on the road, but the leading two-stopper. I mean, when you think at the start of the race where that car was starting from, again, bright, clever strategy, as we saw at Silverstone earlier this year, has brought that car right into contention. At the start of the race, we'd have thought, if a top three position, you would be very lucky indeed. Oh, and this is the nearest we've seen Lawrence Van Thorne getting that position away from the Lamborghini, and he's got a good run off turn four. But again, the Lamborghini, just once it gets in a straight line, just is able to consolidate and, and marginally pull away. Are they in danger of being caught as well? Because hunting them down is Christopher Meese in the Santelok Audi. And Lawrence Van Tor, regarded by many as one of the top GT drivers, now needs to prove it. Can he find a way through? It's not easy to overtake around here. The cars are evenly matched. The team manager of 99, Rover Racing Mercedes, back to the race control building. He must go. So there's another penalty, I fear, heading that way. As Van Tor uses the curb, tries to get up the inside, but the back stepped out. That didn't work. 58 minutes and counting of the race to go. We're into the last hour, the final third of the race, the last hour of the Endurance Series for 2015. And there's still a huge amount to be decided. And he left a bit of rubber on the racetrack in the process yes. of trying to use as much of the 560 horsepower of the Lamborghini, of the, the Audi, and the same the Lamborghini from the same engine. Just it's a question of what the BOP between the two cars is. Good run off. Now, turn 11. This is an opportunity for Laurent Van Thor. If he can stay close to the back of the Lamborghini, he's going to have a look to try and make a manoeuvre up into turn 12. That corner will be, not say blocked, but the Lamborghini will use the middle of the road to defend. And of course, Audi now has lost that advantage coming off a level. Again, up into turn final 15. So let's watch and see what Lawrence Van Thor can do again, right at the back of the Lamborghini. Lamborghini having to go defensive into the middle of the track, forcing the Audi, if you're going to go down the inside, you're going to have to break earlier than me. So it's the Lamborghini that opts to go down the inside. The Audi goes slightly wider. Watch for the cutback, but Van Thor really isn't able to get on the par any earlier than he can manage. Again, has to fall in behind the rear wing of the Lamborghini, but real nip and tucks up. Now, trying to get up the inside, going into turn three. Again, oh, oh, oh. tags are back. No, that was... No, the, I was going to say the Lamborghini is coming back. Now, whether that will be again seen, and the Lamborghini runs wide, and the BMW, nothing to do with this battle, <laughs> just slides ahead. So I think mm. that will be, eventually, will be wondering what was that all about, and uh, the contact, which was very, very slight. Let's look again and see Lawrence Van Thorst coming, coming, coming. Not really in a position to do something, but just, well, it's, it's the lightest of bumps, and I don't know whether that's going to be brought to the attention of the stewards or not. Certainly, it was, uh, there, was, there was light contact, but I yeah. don't know whether that seemed, seemed or deemed to be an unfair pass. Well, a pass it was, and so, yeah, up to the organisers now to decide what, if anything, to do. But Vantor is away and gone, isn't he, now? Oh, He's yes. off like a scalded cat. So, yeah. having got through, I was going to say, before that incident happened, remember how difficult it was early in the race when they were trying to get past Adrian Zaug. I mean, that Lamborghini was a hard car to overtake for really the first hour of the race. There is the race leader, Kevin S. He's in traffic. Now, 
the car pitted the second time while there was that confusion around the safety car and it hadn't got the whole pack behind it. So Kevin S was able to come out in effectively clear track space and then go like smoke to try and catch up to anything because he had the clear road ahead. And that is why, as people pitted afterwards, it suddenly rocketed back up the order. Yeah, but you, say? you said he went like smoke trying to catch up to the tail of the group. Of, but those cars that he was catching up to still behind the safety car because if he was running at a pace which is, you know, I think, greater than that of the safety car pace, would that be seen to be an unfair advantage? Not sure, because he was. He, they do say you've got to catch up to it, so... Yeah, but also, it was so early in the stint as well, there were very few that he had to catch up to. But down to the organisers, they'll have a look at the lap times, won't they, and assess yes. that, whether it was unduly fast. Oh. And there's the Nissan, is it? It's the Audi and the Nissan have had a coming together, so we'll try and get back to that in a moment and piece it all together. Number two, Audi is in strife. And that's the championship leading car. And that was the car, yeah, that led the championship coming into the race and has 23 been involved. It seems Zuliga's concerned on the face of Daryl Cox and of Shio San, so that would be... I mean, how the heck could those two cars come into contact? Again, wave yellow flags, so the Audi gets back underway. That was all the way into turn one that that incident occurred. So uh, is there damage or not to the back or to the side or whatever of the Audi? So the championship leading car coming into this final run we're looking to see the car that at, at one point had been leading. Now, that was in 10th place, so the report we had was that there'd been contact between Audi and Nissan, but trying to piece together where they would have been on the track together. Anyway, the Audi, after its moment, has got going. We'll no doubt have a replay of how it got there. And so that potentially makes life easier for this car with the Audi further delayed, dropping it back even further in the order. So, race leader, still, because he's got to make another stop, Maxim Sule. Second, yet to make another stop, Yama Berman. Third, yet to make a final stop, Dominic Schwager, where he gives back to Stephen Parov in the black Ferrari. And then Kevin Esch leads from Alex Bunker by 6.2 seconds, and the gap is coming down. So, there's the McLaren leading the way, but the gap is coming down between Esch and Bunker. Just to confirm what I was suggesting a little while ago, while you're catching up the queue, you're OK to go at uh, full pace, according to the news we've had confirmed from race control. Dave Ryan nearest to us, Andrew Cocotti in the middle, Rob Bell in the background. Their car is leading, but it's being caught by Alex Bunker, who is all fired up. This will be a good way to end the season, wouldn't it? A fight for race lead. Well, between two cars of totally differing sort of design, integrity, one your, your ultimate sort of sports car group C almost configuration McLaren and the Nissan GTR which is you know a kind of car that you go and buy in a normal Nissan showroom albeit the quickest thing in four wheels so two different cars all with the BOP giving them virtually identical track performance but the gap between those two cars is the whereas the Nissan we can't quite see it yet coming up through turn nine it's Kevin Estra needs to make his way as quickly as possible through this traffic and again the same problem that Kevin is having. So this is Ortelli on board and it was the 173 Martin wow. Plowman Nissan that arrived out of nowhere well, and glanced the left-hand side. What was that all about? Oof. I mean, whatever the speed of the Nissan was travelling at went past the idea, I mean, it is a zillion miles an hour. Yeah. There's an issue about overtaking under the safety car, so a number of drivers being looked into for overtaking behind the safety car, we're told. Kevin S comes up towards the timing line then. The leading two-stopper goes through, and the advantage over Alex Bunker was six seconds last time. The Nissan is 5.1 seconds back, so the gap is there, but the gap is shrinking. Five seconds and 51 minutes, that's not enough, is it? No, it's going to be a tight finish. Uh, we're into the last third of the race, so there is race leader. Uh, 58, uh, 5.1 seconds. I mean, it, I mean, in terms of lap time, you're... Oh, what's Alex... Is he going rally crossing? <laughs> That's his dad's skill. It took a lot of grass on the inside. So Alex Bunkham doing everything he can. Grass tracking coming through turn three. There's the... McLaren goes out of turn six, so wait for the Nissan to come into view. There it is. So the gap as they went across the line on the last occasion, 5.1 seconds. 
traffic will affect the pace of the McLaren. It's going to now affect the pace of the Nissan as the Bentley following through. And this is Stephen Kane again using all that ability. Stephen Kane usually does the final stints. The number one, number seven Bentley and really, really has done some outstanding jobs. Again, getting stopped. Oh, traffic coming up the hill there. And that was a bit of a moment for Stephen Kane, fully committed, and then having to make a, an adjustment on the steering wheel and probably get out of the throttle momentarily. Yeah, Porsche arriving sideways and heading for the gravel, so more drama. Number one, Lawrence Van Tour is being given a driving standards flag for that little bit of contact up the back. Yeah, but that's the only penalty. But he's under observation. He is, so any more of that, and it'll get worse. Right, Kevin S leads the way, Alex Buncombe second. Even if the car is only second in the class in the race, it'll still win the championship, so are they going to settle for second? Let's see, this is the reason for the driving standards flag. I mean, I mean, it, it, the Lamborghini was slowing down and the Audi was still maintaining its pace. To me, there was no intent in that, and, you know, it's, I think the judgment given is uh, a driving standards flag is the right call. Yeah. It, well, there was no intent. I mean, he didn't intend to, to either to pass him there. It was more because of the Lamborghini backing off a little bit earlier than the, the Audi was required to do. Alex Bunker, we have taken loads of the inside of the racetrack coming into turn three. So uh, this time using just the curbing. Gap this time as they came across the line, still 5.3. Actually, Kevin Astra pulled out a couple of tenths a second on that final lap, again, largely because of the way that traffic is interfering with the, 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 the flow of these lead two cars. OK, let's have a quick thought about the championship, because if Alex Buncombe stays second, then he's going to win Pro Cup for himself and Chio and Ripe. But behind, remember, is Stephen Kane. Now, if Kane were to get past the Nissan and to get up into the lead of the race, then the Bentley would win the Pro Cup in the championship. So there's even more pressure on Stephen Kane. He's going as quickly as he can anyway. But can he do anything about the Nissan and then could he set off with 48 minutes to go in pursuit of the McLaren? The lap time suggests maybe not, but Stephen Kane is in traffic. So given a clear lap, you never know. Well, all he can do is doing what he's doing presently. That's drive the wheels off the Bentley. That's why he's usually the third driver in a team of three drivers in the Bentley. We know that in the final stint, when it comes down to the short hairs, that he is the go-to guy in Bentley to deliver. So Stephen Kane will do what this car can do allow him, he can't do any more than that, you know, it'll be down to tyres, it'll be down to the brakes, the brakes will be on the limit, I suspect probably they are, and uh, Stephen Kane will just use that available to him. The Nissan certainly is within reach, and it's a question again whether the pace of the Nissan and the pace of the Bentley pretty much similar, but look, the Bentley is closing this lap, it has run down the Nissan more than it's done in any previous lap. And so the gap between them is down to 0.8 of a second. They've got to get past the Kaspersky Ferrari, which has been in the gravel once in the race, but hopefully it will keep out of the way. Buncombe goes through, and then the Ferrari slots in behind and therefore ahead of Stephen Kane. Yeah, I mean, that was a, that was, you know, a lack of awareness of what's going on on the racetrack, and that's you know, one of the unfortunate things with some of the gentlemen drivers, that that's what they're out there to do, to enjoy themselves, whereas the professional drivers are out there to win this race. Kevin S's last lap was a 59.9, whereas Stephen Kane's was a 57.6, so shows what effects the traffic can have. Stephen Kane, as you would anticipate, is throwing everything at this. Now, Andy Murray did the middle stint in Bentley number seven, and he, like the rest of us, is wondering what the car can do in the hands of Stephen Kane, and it is with OJ. Andy, first question I think has to, um, to contain your nerves. How are they? I can speak to be honest. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's a credit to the championship. Um, you know, to be going into, into the last 45 minutes of this race, and then it's anyone's, isn't it? It's absolutely fantastic. So, uh, yeah, no nails left, but uh, it's, it's a great, great spectacle. Adders has just been going through all the permutations of how you win it. You need to win, you need the Nissan to come second. Can you do it? Yeah, of course we can. Um, you know, then again, so can Nissan, so can Audi. So, you know, we just need to do the best job we can. It's a, it's a fight to the, to the flag, um, and, and, you know, it's going to be flat out. That's what we do. And the pace is there. It looks like the Bentley has the pace. Yeah, we do. We really got really good pace this weekend, and we and we saw that we were disappointed with qualifying. We got we got um, a lower position than we thought we should. Have down the traffic, but, I mean, you know, in the race, we're, we're as quick as we always are. We'll go now, because I think your sister car's pitting. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. 
Yep, 31 is in then, giving up the race lead. And remember that the number seven car was on the fourth row of the grid, so it wasn't massively out of sequence, but a bit further back than they wanted to be. So number 31 then will lose places, of course, by pitting under green flag conditions like this. The seven car, remember, pitted when we had the safety car period. And so the order is going to be shuffled once again. But at the end of this stop, the cars are going to be good to go to the very end, 45 minutes of the race remaining. So Kevin Oestra's advantage over the second place, this and four seconds, so that's come down again largely, as we are seeing with the, you know, catching the traffic and uh, not being able to get through at the point where you want to do so. Kevin Oestra having to juggle you know, traffic, there it is, there's the lead car, and he's had to get throughout what four of the, the back mark of Ferraris, and those Ferraris are all very quick in a straight line, which makes the job of the lead cars, which are always the quickest cars in a straight line, more difficult. But all oh, the, the, the windscreen, the strikes and the windscreen on um, Stephen Kane. When you're driving, you don't see those, you're looking through them. It's only when you stop, you realise just how much muck and rubbish has hit the front of your windscreen. So, Alex Buncombe under pressure. And uh, again, in the case of Nissan, he's the go-to driver to bring the laurels back to Bob Neville's team. But he, he can't afford to relax, he can't afford to get caught out with traffic there, you can see the last three laps and the 64 and 65 have taken two seconds out of the advantage over the Nissan. Again, these two Ferraris directly ahead and a further two up the road. So where are, where is Alex Buncombe going to get past one of them, let alone two of them? And Stephen Kane just adding more pain with those lights flashing. I don't know if they're LED headlights in the Bentley if they are. So up the inside gets the job done on one of the two. And we'd expect to see Stephen Kane slot up the inside of that Ferrari up into turn 15. So no significant gain or loss to second and third place uh, battle. And Kevin Est goes across the timing line, then ahead of them. And the last lap that he did was a 58-0. Buncombe did a 58-6, Kane a 58-9, but it's all down to traffic. So if and when they get a clear bit of track space, then it has a very important effect because then you can see the true pace of the cars. But in real terms now, it is five and a half seconds covering the top three. Alex Buncombe has got himself backed up a little bit behind the Ferrari. And that's what Stephen Kane looks to try and take advantage of the Ferrari, sort of inviting the Nissan to come through, but then not really you know, going forward. So it's all back to the Bentley, getting the run off turn four and the run down into turn five. And this is Stephen Kane looking to find a way past the second place. Duncan Cameron at the wheel of the Ferrari, the car that's already won Pro-Am in the championship, won it at Spa and repaired after its accident yesterday, but seeming to be holding up a little bit at the moment as Kane tries to get a run down here. Is this the chance? No, thought about it, had a good run, but the Nissan, equally powerful, booms ahead again in a straight line. Now he commits to the inside to get past Duncan Cameron and Stephen Kane will want to go with him. Yes, he's got through and he's got through with a little bit more momentum than the Nissan was able to do. Alex Buncombe had to be certain that the Ferrari was giving ground before he would commit. Stephen Kane was watching that and he saw what was going on, but again, the power of the Nissan, that ability to drag itself up the hill out of Turn 7, just again opens up the advantage over the turbocharged V8 Bentley. 42 minutes on the clock still, this is the battle for second place, and it will have an effect on who wins the Pro Cup in the Championship, because if the Bentley can get away, get past the Nissan and get away and then attack the McLaren, then things become very different indeed. But in real terms, they've been concertinaing up anyway, first to third. Alex Bunker will be aware of all of this. Bob Neville spoke earlier on in the weekend about all the charts they have. There is the man himself on the radio, and he'll be communicating to Alex Bunker about the pace of the McLaren, the pace of the Bentley, where they are in the championship. Kevin S goes through them. The last lap was a 57-1. He's pulled the gap out to 6.4 seconds now. Yeah, and that's all due just to the second and third place cars having to battle their way through the traffic. We've just seen all that. Race leaders work their way out of turn one. So Kevin S leading the way. And now, where's the next back mark? A couple of corners up the road. So Alex Buncombe's got clear track space for at least two corners. And way up on the curb, <laughs> Stephen Kane. I mean, almost the, the left side wheels in or on the grass again, much quicker on the exit of turn four. But again, the squirt the Nissan has got once it gets straightened up. And Stephen Kane, there's not enough room there to dive down the inside into turn five. Alex Buncombe shuts the door enough to keep the Bentley, but again, the Bentley will look to make the cut back on the exit coming out of turn six. But again, once Alex gets the car straightened up, you can see just 
by the yard, or that's being European, by the meter, able to pull a couple of car lengths as the way into turn seven. If the Bentley were to get ahead of the McLaren and win the race, the Nissan second, then it's good for the championship for the Bentley boys, but if the Nissan is able to fend off the Bentley, then it's in the box seat. So Stephen Kane's pace relative to the McLaren is all important, but for as long as he's stuck behind the Nissan, it's all academic. Yes, it is, and I think, again, the, the way that McLaren have approached this race, that, that early pit stop on the first sector of the race, and the, the, the good fortune, let's say, of the safety car intervention, giving them that track position to then, once everybody else dived into the pits for their pit stop under yellow flag, put the McLaren in the pound seat, and yeah. Kevin Astra doing the job that he's paid to do. Make no mistake, McLaren is a professional team from Ryan Racing, knows all about how to win races, and that six and a half second advantage that he currently enjoys over this battle for second place, he can afford to be a little bit more relaxed because these two cars have not really made any inroads at any point over the last 10 laps into that leading McLaren's advantage. Now, if anything, he's gone up again, hasn't it? 6.9 seconds, so if things stay as they are, 23 Nissan is going to win the Pro Cup, a Bentley win, a Nissan second, then it's Bentley Championship. Bentley second, Nissan third, it's a Nissan Championship. But for as long as the Nissan is ahead, then the answer is simple. Buncombe, Ripe and Chio will be champions as they work their way now once more up through turn number three. And Alex Buncombe realising that perhaps he hasn't got the pace to go after Kevin S, but what he has got to do is defend and keep that Bentley at bay. 38 minutes and counting now. Once more down towards turns five and six. It was here a lap ago that Stephen Kane made a little move, and again he takes a slightly tighter line out of turn six. But the Nissan is of comparable power, so Alex Buncombe stays ahead on the run downhill. And let's see what the sector times are going to be like. Kevin S has got more traffic to think about and is still pulling away. Another half a second gained in sector one. Yeah, I mean, it goes to show that you can start in the 12th row of the grid, you know, probably down in 24th position, and uh, there you are, come the last sector of the race, be leading it with that calling a 6.9 second advantage a comfortable advantage but knowing that the battle here is more about the second place than it will ultimately be but any challenge that uh, one of the two of these drivers car combinations might be able to offer up in the closing 38 minutes you're on board with Stephen Kane a head look is the effective championship leading Nissan now as they go out of the Advan Bogan up towards the chicane and the gap is down by only a tenth, but it's down between Est and Buncombe in the middle sector. And that's because of all the traffic that Kevin Est has had to work away by. And there's a lot more traffic for these two to find a way through as well. So Alex Buncombe's life is about a change, isn't it? Not just about defending from the Bentley, but he's got to get through the traffic as quickly as possible without leaving an opportunity for Stephen Kane. And that's not going to be an easy task. We've got four cars side by side, all Ferraris coming down the pit lane. They're in their own little battle. They will have to be aware, they'll see flags. But I mean, this is what Stephen Kane will hope, that he can pressure Alex Buncombe into making a marginal manoeuvre and maybe force an issue, and that would allow Kane and the Bentley to get into second place, to demote them this hand down to third. But that's always the difficulty in these endurance races where you get disparity of lap times. Again, you see just the way that the, the, Stephen Kane was forced to go the long, wide way around. Ultimately, it not really cost him an awful lot of time because within another corner, he's back into the the position that he's been in pretty much since these drivers took over the respective cars. Downhill they go for the 70th time. It is still Kevin Est then leading the way in the Von Rahn Racing McLaren. Could that car be the first double winner of the championship's season? It leads the way at the moment. Down towards the Dunlop curve. So, well, Stephen Kane really... I, mean, I think he's actually had to give himself a little bit of a breather because we're running so close to the tail of the Nissan, the temperature of the engine, the temperature of the brakes may be a factor. He's pushed hard all the way to keep in contact with the Nissan, but maybe just now feeling, I've got to give myself a chance to regroup. I've got traffic coming up. I want to be in a good place to use the strengths I have as we get through to that traffic. Can I get all excited about the Jaguar? It's leading Pro-Am. Gabriele Gardel, the former FIA GT champion, is at the wheel, and the Emile Frey Racing Jaguar GT3 is leading the Pro-Am class. This is how the Pro-Am standings are in terms of the race order. Jaguar, Mercedes, Ferrari is the top three. So the Jaguar leads the way. Number 70, Mercedes runs in second place. Cedric Spiazzioli's Ferrari is the one in third. 
uh, and then Michael Lyons Ferrari is in fourth place. Fifth is Sean Johnston in the Mercedes, and sixth now Michael Meadows in number 32 Aston Martin. Uh, it's seventh in the class, is 66, which is the next of the Ferraris. Stephen Parov at the wheel of the car. But the Jaguar, we talked early in the race about how that has got better and better and better. Well, it's had one podium at Silverstone, now it leads the class. And with 35 minutes to go, would it not be a great way to end the season in Pro-Am if we could have the Jaguar as a winner? I think it would be outstanding. I mean, the thing I think the Jaguar have done with this car is get the reliability. The performance was the, the almost secondary. They just needed to get the car to, to, to do the miles, to do then the development with the car that they had been unable to do. They've now got that reliability and they're getting the performance. Now, this is how the AM Championship is going to pan out. Look at this, Ian Loggy, Julian Westwood on the same number of points as Jürgen Herring, Dimitris Constantinou and Frank Schmickler. Now, Loggy and Westwood had a win at Spa, but the Porsche team have not, I think I'm right in saying, had a victory all season. So on a tie break, it would go to the Audi squad because they've had a win. In the meantime, the battle for second place beginning to run down again. Stephen Kane much closer to the back of the Nissan as they come up the hill, threading their way through the traffic. And look at the traffic ahead of the four more cars. And then, in fact, it's five with the, the Parker Racing Audi. And uh, that's the car that is leading right now. So. There's the second yeah, place Porsche the Porsche within Porsche. the championship. So that's the Herring Constantino Frank Schmickler car. I think it's Frank Schmickler in it now, is it not? Because uh, he is hugely experienced. It is second in the class. Now, Schmickler is 35 seconds back from the class leading uh, Fabian Bartes. So it is possible, possible that Schmickler might be able to take the win on the road. Oh, Stephen Kane, what's that all about? Big back side end, the chicane. back end, just suddenly. That's as if he got water on the tyres, and the curbing is holding your moisture, and he just suddenly got the back end of the car. And look, Alex Buncombe's fellow John, when he liked that, he thought, wow, is that, a, is that a potent to what we might see towards the end, 30 minutes or so of the race remaining? Is the Bentley wearing its tyres aggressively? Well, now they've got to get past Stephen Parov's Ferrari. The lead gap is nine seconds. Kevin Astra now is pulling away. On board with Stephen Kane, Buncombe being delayed a bit by the relative newcomer to GT Racing, Stephen Parov. Round the outside goes Buncombe, and there was just room for both of them to do it. That's another heart-in-mouth moment, but it's worked. Yeah, that was a good pass by Stephen Kane. He had the more difficult of the two cars to make his way around. He had to do the long run in Turn 3, and he made it stick into Turn 4. So, again, you know, the remorseless pressure Alex Buncombe is under to consolidate his second place and you can see the joy in the pits of the Nissan team when they saw Stephen Kane almost going for a wild ride as the tail kicked one way, then back the other way as they run up into turn 15. Down to the Dunlop curve again, lap 72. 32 minutes are on the clock still. So this is for second in the race, and it will have a bearing on the outcome of the Pro Cup in the championship, that's for sure. Number 99 Mercedes, incidentally, after its assorted penalties, is now in 15th place. Danny jean there at the wheel. And Andy Suchek's Bentley has just copped a drive-through penalty for speeding in the pit lane. That was the Sule in, Suchek out pit stop, and speeding in the pit lane gives 31 a drive-through penalty now. I haven't talked about the 173 Nissan that led the race for virtually the first hour, Mark Lyman behind the wheel. We saw that contact into turn one, that currently down in eighth place, but uh, some 32 seconds, and there's only 32 seconds between the first and eighth car. Indeed so, but it's about to gain a place when Suchek serves his drive-through. So they'll gain one place back, but after the season they've had, even if they come seventh, I think they'll be pretty chuffed with that because the pace has been there and it's a much better result than has been seen hitherto. This is the second and third battle. It's 0.3 of a second over the line. Stephen Kane right there on the back of the Nissan. Does he think about a move? Well, he may have thought, and he has another thought, but Buncombe repels him. Yeah, I mean, there was almost he went, then he stopped, then he had thought about it again. Will I have a second look at it? And... Uh... Well, there wasn't, by the time he made his second attempt, the, there was a closing gap, and he knew that there was no chance. So, obviously, he thinks maybe in some circumstances, as again, Alex Buncombe does a bit of dirt tracking, running, crossing. Now, Stephen Kane does the same thing on the inside of turn four. I mean, he couldn't have two more equally matched cars, albeit that if the Bentley was ahead of the Nissan, it would pull away. So, they work their way to turn six with just half an hour remaining. This is a battle on track for second place, but as I say, if the Bentley were to get through, 
go after the McLaren, then the championship starts to come alive once again, because for the moment it looks as though the Nissan is good for the title, as long as Alex Buncombe keeps the Bentley at bay. It doesn't matter that the McLaren is winning up the road. And the McLaren's winning up the road by over 10 seconds, 10 and a half seconds, as Kevin Erstrom managed to eke out. So his position is looking more and more comfortable, and it's going to be this knuckle ride and knuckle. I mean, the, 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 the fingers of the Bentley and the, the Nissan team are going to be back down to the quick. There's this battle again that's going to be ultimately, I suspect, decided by traffic. And Stephen Kane just again puts the nose of the Bentley into the, the offside mirror of Alex Buncombe. And uh, just all Alex Buncombe could do is almost just put on blinkers, forget about the Bentley, and whatever happens in this, the Russia, what's happened to that BMW? Stole up at the chicane. Spin at the chicane, yeah. yeah. And stalled after its rotation, seemingly. Now, can that car get going? It's in a pretty awkward place. The leaders have gone by then. Yellow, Yellow flag, flag in that last indeed. sector. But hopefully the car can get going. It's trickling back into life. Everybody else goes past, but Leo Machitsky at the wheel. Everybody and slows right down to full course yellow. It's yeah, not coming up the on the screens, the, but yeah. it's about to now. Yes, yeah. full course yellow is employed. A slight confusion as if some drivers were diving into the pit lane as the BMW got rotating, so it's a full course yellow. And that will, of course, once again, the lead of this race will evaporate because Kevin Astro had worked very hard to get up to 10 seconds. Let's have a look and see up in the chicane. Oh, there's... That's too, fa too quick just, in, isn't it? Yeah, just made a big mistake. But again, drags you know, gravel and rubbish onto the racetrack. So full course yellow. Yeah, Everybody. the team's got the message on the radio before it came up on the timing screens. In fact, it hasn't yeah. yet come up on the timing screens at all. So they got the message on the radio, and therefore some slowed earlier than others. Yeah, well, certainly the second and third place cars were amongst the first we saw who were definitely slowing down on pit straight. So Kevin Estra, where is he in relation to second and third car? There is second and third. Further up the road, it'll be maybe half a dozen cars between second and third. Um, so really, in a full course yellow, there is the lead car, so there shouldn't be any loss or gain to any of the first three cars. Green, track has gone green, and everybody has to be alert. Kevin Astra is the one that needs to very quickly clear these two slower cars ahead of him up the hill, and there is the battle for... Where is it? No, it hasn't even come down into Turn 7 yet. Yeah, it's just behind this little group, isn't it? The Acuria Cost BMW is there ahead of the second Von Rahn McLaren. There's Buncombe, there's Kane behind him. Nine seconds when they started this lap. Now let's hear more of Bob Neville's thoughts. Pressure is on, 28 minutes and counting. Bob Neville runs the Nissans, he's in the pits with OJ. So, Bob, all these hours of driving, all the kilometres driven, and it comes down to a half-hour bun fight. How are your nerves? Uh, a bit frayed, but... Um, yeah, I mean, if, if we don't catch the McLaren, we'd, we'd, we'd come out quite well on the points side of it. But if Stephen got by. But at the moment, Stephen can't get by, so we'll see. So that's the scenario. What do you do? What do you tell Alex? We've just told Alex to drive, and we've let him know that if the McLaren were to win, we'd be OK, and we were third. But um, he's, he's, he's driving so hard, you can hardly talk to him. And um, do you think he can keep that Bentley at bay for half an hour? Um, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bob, thank you. Yeah, don't commit, Bob. <laughs> There's a big ask when you've got somebody like Stephen Kane behind you, but Alex Buncombe, who uh, has really blossomed as a GT driver over the last few years, he also has these occasional enduro races in Australia through Nissan again in the V8 Supercar Championship, but uh, still rather overlooked by the British media for reasons unknown, but he is a very, very good peddler, Alex Buncombe, and he is doing a good job of keeping Stephen Kane at bay. There is the scene in the Bentley pit bunker, studying all the monitors, all the data, all the permutations. Yeah, I mean, this is getting really sort of pressure time for the Nissan. 30 minutes, 26 minutes, in fact, remaining. And it only takes one, one little mistake, one little slip in traffic, and the Bentley will be up into second place. The gap between first and second is currently 8.6 seconds. So the prospect of the Bentley running down the McLaren in these closing 26 minutes, I don't think it's going to be great, but the, the change for second place is realistic for the Bentley diet, for the Bentley guys. Up through eight and up through nine, and again, driver matching driver. Again, this bunch of cars come in. The Astons are the first of the cars that they're going to meet. 
So the straight line performance, very similar. But you can see how Stephen Kane really looks up the inside, tries to make it. Oh. oh. Well, that nearly caught Alex Bumcom by surprise. Opportunistic move by Stephen Kane, and it almost came off. But because it didn't, and Stephen Kane had to back out of it, he's lost a bit of time. But here he comes again up towards the chicane now. So from being absolutely together, he's about two lengths back into the breaking zone. They come through the left, through the right, back on the power. 25 minutes of the race to go. The lead gap down fractionally last time at 8.6 seconds. Kevin S goes through, still lapping in the high 57s. And Alex Bunker may have been able to get after him if he weren't having to defend like crazy. He's lapping about nine tenths slower. So the gap is going up because a lot of Alex Bunker's energy here is going into fending off the Bentley. And Stephen Kane, likewise, might be able to catch were he to get past. But for now, they are still tied together. Look at that. It doesn't get much closer, does it? No, with the strengths of the cars you know, under braking and in some of these corners, particularly through turns three and four, the Bentley does seem to have a marginal advantage. But once you get pointing in a straight line, then the Nissan just lights up those turbos. Again, Stephen Kane can't really get any closer coming through these final corners onto the first of these relatively short straight down into turn five. The Bentley looks one way, then Nissan covers that. So into turn five, not likely to be a, a realistic chance to pass. Traffic is again going to be the feature. Stephen Kane, good round turn six, and close to the back of the Nissan. But again, it's the squirt of the Nissan in the straight line that just is able to leak away another car length, then underbrakes the Bentley, runs right up to the tail, almost under the rear wing. You can see in the back of the Nissan, I suspect the Nissan's probably struggling for rear end grip. Ultimately, that's what Alex Buncombe is having to contend with, and he can't really commit. A little bit sort of cautious going through the first part of turn eight, up the hill through the right hand, and then back up into turn ten. More traffic ahead as well, so they've got to cope with that as they work their way up through the right hander, powering their way downhill. We understand as well that Wolfgang Reich has vacated his, himself in the pit garage. He's got to go and sit in the hard car because he's so nervous he can't bear to watch this. Alex Bunkin with all the pressure on him. Up front, Kevin S leading the way with nothing to lose, really. There's a race win at stake, but he doesn't have to think about the championship frustratingly because of bad results at Spa across 6 and 12 hours plus the end of the race. But Kevin S still leads, and for Dave Ryan's team, it could well be, looks like it is going to be, a second win of the year. Alex Bunkin only has 23 more minutes to keep Stephen Kane at bay. To be fair, even if the Bentley got second and the Nissan were third, it would still be enough for Alex Bunkum as he's about to have to work his way through the traffic. Gets up the inside of 27 Aston there, diving down towards turn one. Goes past you and Hankey. And then Stephen Kane will try and get past the Aston Martin as well. I thought maybe the Aston might have been a bit more generous to the Bentley this time. Looking to try and get up the inside into turn three. The gap is left. So again, it's just it's the management of the traffic. St uh, Alex Bunkum got through cleanly and uh, Stephen Kane just at that moment didn't quite get the follow through that he'd hoped, but back onto the tail, under the rear wing, back to turn five, and I mean, it's just been the same lap upon lap upon lap. Downhill they plunge then, lap 77, 22 minutes and change on the clock, it's ticking away. 10 seconds is the Kevin Esther advantage now. Stephen Kane still chases after Alex Buncombe. And there's more traffic up the road. Look, three more back markers that they've got to sort out, rounding the Dunlop curve. The power kicks in now as they run up the hill. And Alex Buncombe has spent the majority of this stint having to fend off Stephen Kane. He's having to dab the brakes even going into turn, and that indicates to me that his rear tyre really, really is on the limit. There's nothing much he can do. I mean, that's the first time I've seen a car dabbing the brakes uh, at pace into turn eight. on the run down towards the Advan Bogan. They're now speed building at this part of the circuit all the time. Yes, it is. Straight line performance from the Nissan is the thing that's keeping it in second place. It's, I don't think there's an awful lot else that Alex Buncombe was going to be able to do. And again, just keeping an eye on the traffic once to get past this car into turn 15. If he does, again, the, the momentum is going to swing towards the Bentley right on the tail of the Nissan. But we know once the power gets down, the traction absorbs all the torque from the Nissan. Look, look, you can see literally just eking its way further and further away. And Stephen Kane could put his, push his foot through the firewall of the Bentley, <laughs> wouldn't go any faster. And under braking, he tries to close back up. The Acuria cost BMW to the left. They're going to have to get past Ollie Bryan here. 
He and Alex have raced against each other in modern GT and historic sports cars as well. And this is Stephen Kane's chance. A little bit of contact there as he tried to get up the inside. The Nissan being oh, compromised by the BMW. He runs wide. Stephen Kane's alongside. He's on the outside line for the next corner, but he's done it right round the outside. He got wrong footed by the BMW. And uh, the choice went to Stephen Kane. He got the clear shot out of turn three through turn four. And poor Alex Bunkham had nothing he could do. He was wrong footed by the BMW and he couldn't adapt or adjust quickly enough to prevent Stephen Kane seizing that opportunity. Again, the Nissan running wide coming out of turn six. But that, that, that was the moment that he's driven this session, waiting for that yeah. one moment to give him the chance. There were a couple of other opportunities. He thought he might have just gotten ahead, but he's now got that clear air. He's got 10 and a half seconds in 20 minutes remaining. Can he take half a second a lap out of the lead of Kevin Estra? And then he's got to think about how can I overtake him for victory. Or can Alex Bunk have come back at him? Because, of course, Stephen Kane still hasn't got past the BMW that was a bit uncooperative as far as Alex Bunk was concerned. Big bobble from the Bentley as it came into turn 10. That's something I didn't expect to see. We saw once here a few laps ago on the exit of turn 11. But Stephen Kane, I mean, it's, it's not a job done in the sense that once he got past. Now, watch what happens. It's Alex Bunkham, a bit of a nudge there from Stephen Kane. No gain, no loss. But then Alex has gone out wide, and already Stephen Kane's up the inside. Bunkham tries to come back, but there's too much of the Bentley, too close yeah. to the... And then it's the momentum that really took the Bentley through. So Alex Bunkham got just wrong-footed and thinking maybe the Bentley was coming through here. Of course, he's still got the BMW on the outside. He's trying to keep the car on the racetrack. The back's skipping and hopping across the racetrack. And then he's clear. Once the BMW, once the, uh, the Bentley gets its nose ahead, then there's no going back. So now it's a rather more resigned expression in the Nissan garage. It's Captain Master Chia referring to the contact there, but it all started because Ollie Bryant and the BMW was getting in the way. Yeah, I mean, and the responsibility of the car that's being lapped is to get out of the way, especially of, of cars at this pace under this position. So I think there might be a lot of happiness between Curia Cars and, and Nissan uh, on the flight home tonight. Well, they've now got through, but Guy Smith's car that Andy Merrick took over and has now got Stephen Kane behind the wheel is edging away from the Nissan as they head downhill then. 18 more minutes on the clock. Kevin Estrit is leading by 12 seconds. And number seven must give back the position to number 23, it says on the timing screen. The Bentley must give the place back to the Nissan, and that presumably has to be because of the contact. I would assume that's the only thing I could see. I don't see how that contact had any significant bearing, other than that I suppose Nissan would say, well, he bumped into the back of us and unsettled the back of our car, and we were then slightly forced out wide so that's a judgment from the race director. So number seven is going to have to concede. Well, no one saw that one coming, least of all Stephen Kane. Absolutely, so he's going to do the hard work all over again. So there it is, confirmed on the graphic. Car seven must give back the position to 23. And that'll really frustrate Stephen Kane because not only did he pass, he pulled away as well. So they've got to do the swap, and then Stephen Kane has got to do it again. But yeah, you saw the contact. It certainly did force the Nissan out wide. And well, so it, now it, he's got to swap over. I don't. I, I, I wouldn't say that it did force the Nissan out wide. There was a contact, but I think just the, the, the biggest problem was that the Bentley was on the inside, the, the BMW was on the outside, and there was nowhere for the Nissan to go on the inside. It had to stay wide, and of course, by, by being wide, then the, it, that's where the BMW all came into play. So Stephen Kane, I don't know how many laps he feels he can continue running ahead of the Nissan, but he will have to concede that very shortly. But he will try and well, there's nothing to be nothing to be gained. Just let the the, the Nissan there, there he goes. goes. So the Nissan goes through ironically almost at the same <laughs> part of racetrack where this all so now he's gonna come back immediately. I mean he should have been under the rear wing. The minute the Nissan went ahead, I'd have been right under the back of the Nissan again and giving Alex Bun uh, Alex Bunker the, the most amount of grief that I could judgment by the director or by the stewards. Uh, and under the circumstances, I don't think anybody's going to complain about it. So the battle continues. Alex Bunkham has still got to defend for 16 and a half minutes, so it's not finished yet. And we know that Stephen Kane is on his toes. We know that he will seize any opportunity. Okay, it's going to be in traffic. So a McLaren up ahead. So let's look and see Alex Bunkham, what he can do. Guy, at this point in the race, it's a very simple question. Was that fair, having to give the place back? No. Um, Stephen, 
got a run on him, he came across, they touched, but that was that. And then Alex, um, Alex ran wide, Stephen had a run. They raced side by side, cleaning for the next corner. It's a really good move, actually. So. Stephen's proving, though, he's got the pace to get past the Nissan. Yeah, I think the Nissan's holding us up. Stephen's got really good pace, but, um, you know, we know the Nissan's very quick in a straight line, and uh, he's using its strength. So he, um, he had to take the opportunity while he was there, and, and, and we all thought it was a great move, but well, that's racing, so... Thank you, Guy. No problem. You can sense the frustration, but we're not done yet. Guy Smith watches on as Stephen Kane mounts another assault then on the run past the pits, Nissan versus Bentley. Look at all the traffic ahead that they've got to find a way through. Ugly. It's ugly. <laughs> There's a McLaren to get by, which Alex Bunker will try to commit to as he gets up the inside of Adrian Quave Hobbs' car. Stephen Kane goes with him. Right, is it game on? Like we had a couple of laps back. They could not be closer, could they? Well, it's the same point of track, and the Bentley clearly is quicker through turns two and three. And it was at this point of track that a little bit of contact occurred. This time, Alex Spunkham makes sure he is absolutely on the inside line going into turn three. Gets ahead of the ID and the outside, it gets out of the way. But again, the Bentley all over the rear wing of the, of the Nissan. But it's that, you know, Guy Smith told us, we have seen it all afternoon. Straight line performance of the Nissan has been its salvation. Downhill they had then, out of turn six. Alex Buncombe defending the inside line, 14 more minutes on the clock. And these two have run together nose to tail for virtually the whole of this stint, haven't they? They're going down towards the Dunlop curve again. Lap 81, Bentley breaks as late as it does. The Nissan swings through the right-hander. Is Guy Smith going to be able to get a tighter line out of the corner? No. Can he sprint up the hill alongside? No. Alex Buncombe able to hang on to this as they work their way into the Schumacher S now. Now, let's have a very quick word from Katsumasa Chio. He is another nervous onlooker to all of this. He's with OJ. Gio, 14 minutes left. Simple question again, can you hang on? Yeah, it's hard to see it, very stressful. So as time goes so slow, I've never longest time in my life. So I hope he can hold on his position for the last, last minutes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, time goes so slowly. I tell you point. what, a chill sound. Look forward to getting old because, believe me, time goes a lot more quickly. <laughs> Out of the oh, look come. at it. Good run, a good run. Oh, it's that was a, a strong run from Stephen Kane as he came out of the chicane, and uh, Alex Buncombe was honoured. But uh, it was an indication that Stephen Kane has not given up hope of taking that second place. The gap between them, four tenths. The gap between the leader and the second place car, 16 seconds, because A, they've got traffic to get through here, which Kevin S had a few laps back, but of course he's on his own, driving his own race, whereas Buncombe is so, so busy defending, and he's also got to be mindful of the traffic and every car that he comes up to. How does he get past without leaving the door ajar for Stephen Kane? It happened once, and look what the outcome of that was. Both of them using lots and lots of curve as they work their way through turn three. Kane again much quicker, coming out of turn four, but there just aren't enough passing opportunities. Well, I mean, there are opportunities. The problem is that every time there's an opportunity made, as soon as the, the Nissan points in a straight line, bosh, it's gone. I mean, Stephen Kane's all over the back of the Nissan through the twiddly bit. Down the hill, again, watch the performance. Up, rides the curb a little bit. That might check the performance. So Stephen Kane will take that on board, think maybe I've got a chance. Again, he just hasn't got the track position to, 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 to force the issue. I mean, almost again in contact with the Nissan in turn seven. Watch the Nissan out, see if the tail lights come on once again as he comes up the hill. Yes, they do. So, I mean, rear end grip is the limiting factor. That's been the limiting factor for the last quarter or more of this sector uh, for Alex Bunker. And again, Stephen Kane the quicker as they head into the next S through to the Bill Stein curve. There's another back. Marker ahead and Kane again goes to the inside. Is he up alongside? No, not fully. Another little nudge, but the Nissan just comes out ahead. Oh, I tell you what, imagine. What it's like being in the pit lane is one thing, but being in the seat of that number 23. And this is a real battle between two great drivers doing outstanding jobs. Defence on the one hand, attack on the other hand. So, with what, 11 and a half minutes to go, 
Stephen Kane has not given up again, closes right up against oh, the nose oh. of inside the Nissan, but the drag, the power of the Nissan will have it into turn one ahead. But Stephen Kane, if he can stand his ground on the inside, might have a chance. Where's the nose of the Nissan? It's still on the outside line. This time, surely Stephen Kane is going to get the job done under braking for turn one. Yes, he's done it at last. He goes deep into the corner. Alex Buncombe tries to get the undercut and get level with him to turn two. But Stephen Kane has done it. Great, great thought working out. He got the nose on the inside in the middle of turn 15. Alex Buncombe couldn't get on the power as early as he needed to do. And the momentum then swung from the Nissan, even though it's quicker in a straight line, had the momentum, went back to the Bentley, but hanging on down that road, 700 meter pitch straight. I thought that the Nissan had enough legs to get not just alongside, but to stick its nose and therefore take it the lead again, or the, the advantage away from, from Stephen Kane. But, well, I called him a terrier before the race got underway, and that's pretty much what he did. He bit the leg off Alex Buncombe in that process to get past. 17 seconds up the road is the leading McLaren. Stephen Kane now has got only 10 minutes left, which is not, I fear, enough laps to do anything about the leading car, but he's going to have a go. There's Alex Buncombe in third place then as they work their way through the Schumacher S. Just up the road is the number four Audi. It's a back marker. Number one, by the way, is still fourth, Lawrence Vantor. Not that far behind in the background, and Kane almost gets badly, badly bought by number four. He's not got past it yet. What is the Audi doing? Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's just poor driving. The, the Bentley all over the Audi coming into turn one. The Audi turned in early. I mean, I mean, I just sometimes whoever is in the car just get it. Sasha Bottomau is well, the driver. That is poor, poor driving. Again, coming. And again, again oh. not even conceding and now we can almost see Alex Buncombe using that opportunity to regain the momentum has been lost by Stephen Kane. Again, the Audi shuts the door and uh, he's racing for position, isn't he? He's now tripped himself up by being on the wrong line, but bottom man is treating this as a proper battle for position and it's not, he's being lapped. But I mean, surely somebody must be telling him, well, get out of the way. It's on the timing screen, car four must respect blue flags, but finally the Bentley goes through, now Alex Buncombe has got the same problem. A car in 27th position, <laughs> holding up the lead or the second and third base in a significant battle. Well, you know, at least some of these drivers, arms or not, I don't care. There are blue flags out there, and he it came into effect, and that's poor driving, in my judgment. Sasha Bottomam, who's done lots of French GT racing, he's done the Carrera Cup France, done a couple of Seat championships. He's a pretty experienced driver, so he's still in the way of Alex Buncombe. And look behind, look, because number one Audi is also buying into this. We haven't talked about Lawrence Van Tour much, but look, he's not far behind the Nissan now. If Buncombe well, loses another place, it's back to the calculator. Eight and a half minutes, and Laurent Van Thor probably got a bit of momentum up behind him. So th this and still running behind a 27th place car. I mean, it's just crazy. Now he gets through finally. Somebody might have got on the radio and said, look, you know, wake up and obey. Now he runs totally <laughs> wide onto the dirty part of the track, serves him right. <laughs> So, just to throw something else into the melting pot, were the Audi to get past the Nissan, uh, that would mean that the Bentley and Nissan would end the year on the same number of points. But the Nissan would win the championship because it's had a win on the tie-break. Are you following all of this? Uh, so. Yeah, but is the podium big enough? The winner's podium to get six drivers <laughs> and share the pot for six months apiece. <laughs> Yeah. We've still got seven and three quarter minutes, so the story ain't over yet. But and look at Vantor, he's suddenly back in the fight. I'm quite right, and I mean, we know that this, in my view, has been struggling for a rear end bite. Uh, Lawrence Van Ford doesn't appear to have any of those troubles, has run down the third base, uh, what well, is now the third base, Nissan doing one minute 50, uh, 56. Lauren Van Thor's oh. last lap. Van Thor up the curb, sideways, lots of arm twirling as he gets it back on track. So Stephen Kane, clear. But there is the margin look, because as he came out of the last corner, into the second corner goes Kevin S. But he's got a whole galaxy of cars to wriggle away past as well. There is the second place Bentley. It's 19 seconds, in fact. The gap has come down by six tenths, but it's not enough. But Stephen Kane, yet again, has thrown everything at this. What he needs now is for some bad luck to inform Alex Buncombe. And if his tyres are going off, the pace might ebb away even more. Well, well, well. <laughs> I mean... The last thing Alex Buncombe wanted was having had to deal with a whole stint of a Bentley headlights burning into the back of your car. You've now got a set of Audi headlights burning into the back of your car. And it's six and a half minutes to go, and it isn't over. And it, again, traffic could be the factor that brings an overtake into play. Lawrence Van Thor wants the podium. He likes the podium, <laughs> and he's got the momentum again. He's, he's positive, where Alex is having to be 
defensive yeah. and by nature than negative. Downhill, six and a half minutes to go. A lap, remember, is just under two minutes on this full version of the Grand Prix circuit. And as the cars now climb uphill once again, Lawrence Van Tour is inching up onto the back of the Nissan. He's not storming up there, but he's creeping up onto the tail. There is the second-placed car then that in the first sector, blimey, was over a second quicker than the McLaren. But Kevin Esther still got such a gap that he can afford to be a little bit more relaxed in his driving than Stephen Kane. And then up the pace if he needs to at the very end. But I don't think it's ever going to get to that point. No, no, it's not. It's all over and dusted. Other than something particular or peculiar that might happen, uh, it's, it's a McLaren victory for Von Ryan Racing. The battle is for third place between Van Four and Fourth and Alex Buncombe, who again has got to defend. Now, for Pro-Am honours, the Jaguar is being caught, look, by Cedric Spriezioli. So, 1.2 seconds between Jaguar and Ferrari for the Pro-Am lead. Remember the Jaguar we saw a little while back, and it had a comfortable advantage. Cedric Spriezioli, the Monagas driver, has hunted him down. And this, I fear, for the Jaguar team will change before the end. And that will be a first victory for the Ferrari duo. But if Gabriele Gardel, who's a hugely experienced GT racer, former FIA GT champion, can hang on in there, it would be a maiden win for the big cat, and that'd be something else to cheer about. Well, it would be a great result, because you're going to have a McLaren winning, you're going to have a Bentley second in, in the pro section, and if you have a Jaguar winning pro-am, you know, it's a pretty good day for the British manufacturers. This is how it looks in Pro Cup then. Jaguar, Ferrari, Ferrari, Mercedes, Aston Martin, Mercedes. The gap 1.2 seconds at the start of this lap. But actually, Gabriele Gardel quicker in sector one. He's pulled away by a couple of tenths. Chio San looking at more points calculations, I think, this. He's got his spreadsheet out, hasn't he, of who's doing what to which and to whom. Well, it is tense moments with four and a half minutes remaining. And. Uh, Whatever they're going to look at ain't going to make any difference because there is the challenge coming now from Lawrence Van Thor. The Audi doesn't have the straight line performance the Nissan has. It's the same kind of battle for the track position that we saw with the Bentley behind the Nissan for so many laps. But Lawrence Van Thor will once again be using the speed of the Audi much quicker up the hill in terms of traction and acceleration and up through turns eight, turn nine. Can he do something into turn ten? It would be a brave manoeuvre too far back in reality, though. Four minutes to go then, so that's going to be two, maybe three laps before the very end as the cars now work their way up towards the Ad Van Bogen. So looking at the points, this is how we are at the moment. 62 for the Nissan team, 59 for the Bentley boys. But if the Audi gets past, remember that takes points away from Buncombe and Chio and Ripe, and then it becomes effectively a tie break between Nissan and Bentley. So it's still not over with three and a half more minutes yet to go who we'll be talking to as champions at the end of the race is not yet decided. Vantor still trying hard, he's way up the kerb there, pushing as hard as he possibly can. Alex Buncombe will come through now then. Three minutes and change on the clock as they work their way over the timing line, down then towards turn one. The Nissan has half a second in hand as they go down into the braking zone. Alex Buncombe stands on the brakes, works his way now through the first right-hander. He's into the Mercedes arena and going with him, look, is still Laurence Vantor. He was the champion here in the Nürburgring round a year ago. The championship won't go the way of the Belgian in the Endurance Series this year, but he still wants another place. If he can get past Buncombe, it's his, but he can't do it at Turn 3. The Nissan fends him off for the moment. They're on the power. Now the run down towards Turns 5 and 6 there. In second spot is Stephen Kane, and in fact, he's fallen further away from Kevin S. The gap now is 16.2 seconds, so the Bentley drops further back. And Kevin Est with the McLaren once again using very clever pit work to get the car into the lead of the race and benefiting a bit from the safety car confusion that we had. But Est, we hardly see it in the stint because we've been so busy looking at other battles, but he's not put a wheel wrong and it's been another epic stint by Kevin Est. For my money, probably the best GT racer there is, but that's another debate to have another time because here are two others that could lay claim to that. Alex Buncombe, who's really shone in Nissan's. Lawrence Vantor, very much part of the Audi brand in GT racing winner here this year of the Nürburgring 24 hours which used all of this circuit and a lot more miles besides on the Nordschleife and as they work their way now through the Advan Bogen keeping an eye to where the leader is there he is Kevin S he's going to start the last lap then this time so one more lap to run S is the leader the Von Rahn Racing McLaren is set to be the first double winner in the championship and it will be the only double winner because the class battles below in Pro-Am and Am 
will be for first-time winners. So there you've got Kevin Est in the McLaren, the MP4 12C, pensioned off in favour of the 650S. Andrew Kokodi oversees McLaren's GT project. He's nearest to us. Dave Ryan's in the middle. The taller, beardy guy is Shane Van Gisbergen, the Kiwi star of the V8 Supercar Championship. And I think he's enjoyed his European tour with a win at Silverstone and a win at the Nürburgring. Two circuits he'd never raced at, of course, before. He's been learning about new venues all year. And but for disappointment at Spa, their championship story could be very different as well. Here, then, is champion-elect Alex Buncombe. But he needs to keep Laurence Van Tour behind him for one more lap to be absolutely sure of that. To turn four, they come, and Van Tour up the inside, up the kerb as well. Doesn't quite pay off, he had to back out of it, but Van Tour committed. But the big Nissan pulls away in a straight line. The turbo kicks in, the Audi slots in behind. More nervous faces at Nissan. I don't think they breathe for the last hour, but they can do so soon, and then crack open the champagne, potentially, if Alex Bunkham, who has had to soak up so much pressure in this stint, OK, Stephen Kane got past him, but they're still there to win a championship. Katsumasa Chio nervously looks on. Who's going to be the person that knocks on the hire car door of Wolfgang Reip and says, you can come out now, champ, uh, because he may not know any of this. So, so nervous. Don't look at all. Into the last few corners comes Kevin Est, set for a race win. Karim is further up the road there in the BMW that's running second. The Karim car, Oliver Grutz, his co-driver at the wheel of the BMW. So Est into the chicane for the last time. It is going to be a second win of the year then for Davy Ryan's team. Von Ryan racing for Kevin S for Rob Bell, who did the first in for Shane Van Gisbergen, who we barely saw in the middle because the car wasn't really in contention at all. But it's in contention when it counts for a race win for McLaren. Kevin Est wins the final round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. A win for Dave Ryan there, along with his co-drivers, Rob Bell, Shane Van Gisbergen, the partners in the race for Kevin Est. Second will go the way of Stephen Kane, Guy Smith and Andy Merrick. And third will be Alex Buncombe, Wolfgang Reip and Katsum Azuchio to win Pro Cup in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series for Bob Neville's Nissan team. And there is a great reception for that from the Nissan guys hanging over the pit wall. Tremendous job done by Alex Buncombe in the last stint. Lawrence Vantor comes home fourth. And I think Wolfgang Reip, yes, there he is. <laughs> has made his way out of the hire car. Bob Neville on the headset, hopefully saying, well done, Alex. Wolfgang Reip embraces Katsumasa Chio. And jubilant scenes. Bob Neville's squad has worked its way up through British club racing the hard way. It's had some dramas along the way. It's battled on with occasionally un uncompetitive cars, but with a full budget from Nissan and the GT3 onslaught it's been able to launch. It has all now clicked into place. And that, for Bob, former... Formula One mechanic, racer himself, racing the British Saloon Car Championship as it was in the 1970s to running a team. That is his crowning moment. Now, this is Pro-Am, and the Jag is still in the lead, but only just the championship-winning Ferrari is getting in the way because it's from the same team as AF Corsa, and there's a bit of team orders going on to try and let the Ferrari get through the yellow car, operated by the same team. He's trying to find a way by, but 51 Ferrari eventually... No, doesn't let the Jaguar pass. It's going to be a sprint to the line. Gabriele Gardel there to fend off Cedric Sprezioli. AF Corsa trying to use one car to help the other, up towards the line they come, and as they took the chequered flag, the Jaguar wins by three tenths of a second, fantastic! After so many years of heartache, the Emil Frey Jaguar team has scored a result, and I can see the, pe the uh, people on the pit wall, the team celebrating, they can't believe it! The cameras are flashing, the cheers are going off, they are having an absolutely vast party already, the Emil Frey team, because so many years of hard work, has just paid off in a class win. May not sound much compared to people winning championships, but for a small team like that, that is a big, big moment. So Kevin Est heads for all the old rubber to get pick up on the tiles, to boost the weight of the car, brings it back towards the pit lane. What a race. So much to talk about, so much going on. And let's hear from our victors. Alex Buncombe will get, no doubt, with John as soon as the car arrives back in the pit lane, but Bob Neville must be a very, very proud team manager, a dream come true, I suspect, for him, and he is ready to talk to OJ. Bob, I would guess yeah. that was the longest half an hour of your life so far. Longest three hours. <laughs> what a win, yeah. though. How would you feel? Well, absolutely over the moon. So tense, that, you know, with the... Uh, we weren't sure if, if the Audi got us, whether we'd be on equal points then with the Bentley, and... Uh, that was as close as you need to get. And how excited were you to see how much it meant, not just to you, not just to the drivers, but to the whole of the Nissan team? Well, they've just worked tirelessly, so, yeah, fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you very much.
Yeah, it's not just a race win, it's not just a championship win, it's many, many years of hard work. The contact goes back a long time now between Martin Plowman and uh, Stefan Ortelli is under investigation and also overtaking under the full course yellow being investigated for the 52 Ferrari that we've just been getting excited about and number 32 Michael Meadows Aston but none of that's really going to affect the uh, outcome of the championship particularly it might have a bearing on second place in Pro-Am in the race but uh, we'll worry about that if news comes before the drivers head towards the podium so McLaren Bentley, Nissan, the top three in the Pro Cup. Pro-Am, Jaguar, Ferrari, Ferrari. As the celebrations begin, Kevin Ash gets out of the car. Rob Bell there to congratulate him. Shane Van Gisbergen comes across as well. And wait for the reception that Alex Buncombe is going to get, along with Katsuma Sachio and Wolfgang Reip. Shake of the head, he can't believe it, because Alex Buncombe, after that stint, has secured the Pro Cup in the Blancpain Endurance Series. Alex Buncombe gets out of the car a champion and in modest fashion to begin with, walks over to the team to start the celebrations. And it was a great job done. I think Alex can't believe it. There's a lot of emotion in that crash helmet, I'm sure. All the pressure for the last hour and he's done it. And Alex, who's worked for so many years to prove that he is a good GT racer, as I said in commentary in the race, he's still overlooked by many. This, for some reason, there's this sort of unfashionable air to Alex. That people don't latch onto him in the same way that they uh, lionise other British drivers. But he has proved that he's every bit as good as those with a higher profile. And he's loyal to the Nissan brand as well. Let's hear from the race winners first of all john has got them rob bell goes first rob bell congratulations you. You, you've won the race starting from the 12th row of the grid yeah absolutely we i don't know if it's a bit unexpected or not but look we hung on in there we kept it clean uh, i think we all we didn't hit anyone we did a great job in our respect and the guys back in the uh, the paint really deserve it because they made the calls on the safety car when we pitted and that really gave us the impetus and uh, Kevin did a great job at the end to keep it keep it uh, clean and and actually pulled away. So in the end, it looked quite comfortable. Kevin, you had the pleasure of bringing the car across the line first. weren't really challenged, but the, that pit stop and the timing of it just really worked to your advantage. Yeah, I think the guys behind the monitor, you know, uh, James Carter and Andrew and uh, and Dave did a great job, and we just caught the right moment on the pit stop on both times, and uh, we made a lot of time there. No no major issue anywhere, and uh, the car was great. I could. I had a I had a small gap at uh, at the beginning of my stint, and I could pull a, a bigger gap while the other were fighting, and then I was just controlling it. So, mega the car was really constant, and I'm I'm really happy to uh, to finish this this championship on the on the highest place. And I think we could have a uh, we could definitely have won this championship without a a small problem with another car in Paul Ricard. We're running out of time, Shane. Well done. Just say well done to the folks in New Zealand. Ah, oh, it's awesome. So good to be up here, but. Um... Thank you to the team, the strategy race, put it on 40 minutes in, it was unbelievable that we made it, so um, just stoked to be here, thanks for the team. Well done guys, thank you, congratulations again. So three very, very happy drivers in the background, the Bentley boys, perhaps less happy, Stephen Kane gave it his best shot, but just not to be, but how about that, the Nissan drivers are victorious, and of course it was here earlier on in the season that... Uh, the Nissan had big dramas in an earlier race. We'll come to that in a moment. Let's hear from the Nissan drivers. Congratulations, guys. Champions, you were in a terrible state. Yeah. You were in your car watching. I don't know what you're watching. You look like you had no rear grip for over half your stint. Tell us, about Alex, what was it like? First, I'd like to say just thank you to everyone involved. It's an uh, unbelievable feeling. Um, we've worked so hard as a team and Get the championships, uh, you know, absolutely fantastic. So I'm a little bit shocked. So uh, yeah, you might want to be the cheer first. Well, I can see you're overwhelmed with emotion, but just tell me, we were saying that you had no rear end grip. Was that the problem ultimately? Yeah, I mean, I, had, I started the stint on new tyres, and we know the GTR's not the kindest on its tyres. And I knew I had Kaney behind me. He was going to be quick, and he was. And to start with, there wasn't a lot in it. He had a few tenths on me, and then uh, I knew my tyres were going to go more more than the Bentley. It's been like that all season, and. Uh, yeah, just well done, champion. Wolfgang, yeah. you had a great stint as well, but were you really sitting in your car? You you couldn't watch it. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't watch it anymore. Honestly, uh, I was uh, waiting because uh, it was too much emotions for me. 
You've got to control those emotions. You're a racing driver. Uh, yeah, when I'm in the car, but not outside. <laughs> anyway, well done. Congratulations. Gio San, yeah. you're almost, you can't say very much, really. Yeah, it was an incredible race. Uh, we are now champion. I couldn't expect it. It's difficult to say how to say, you know. The team did a really great job, and uh, Alex Bandy was great run. Uh, it was the longest time in my life, and the last minutes. It's, uh, yeah, I want to say thanks for the whole team involved. This team, Team Argen, it's fantastic. This is good for me. Thank you very much. Well, you've all done a wonderful job. I'll tell you what, back in Japan, you're going to be number one as well. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to fight again in Super Japan. I, I, I couldn't think it. I just, you know, emotion the, the moment. So thank you very much. Well, congratulations, all of you. Well done, Wolfgang. Well done, Alex. And uh, go off and celebrate. I'm sure you will. Yeah, here earlier on in the year, there was the serious accident that Nissan was involved in in the VLN race, but the team has regrouped and the success here, testimony to how everybody has come good. And uh, there, more happy scenes. This, just going back a few moments, was how Gabriele Gardel was greeted as the winner of Pro-Am by the Emil Frey team, carrying their man aloft to celebrate. <laughs> and that car, as I say, has had so much grief over its troubled development, but great, great, great result. Now the team probably thinks it's a great show. The season's come to an end. Lorenz Fry and Freddie Barth, the other two drivers. Now, let's uh, hear from the Jaguar team. They've won Pro-Am for the first time, and John is with them. Uh, Freddie, I think you guys, your team, are the happiest guys in Park Ferme. You're just delighted. Absolutely, there are no words for it. I mean, it was such a hard fight during all year, all the years, we have to say. And finally, we did it. I mean, it was a great success for the whole team, for everyone with and nothing to say. I mean, well, who do you think is more surprised? Your competitors or you? I would say the competitors, but for us, it's a surprise that we finally did it. Well, well done. <laughs> Come on. So, emotions. Everybody is so emotional. Yeah, for sure, because it's four years really heavy work, and this is the payback. We really work hard, we were some kind of unfortunate, but the, today everything worked really correct in the race, and we could set our pace. So, well, thanks to everybody. Well, congratulations, and isn't it always better to finish the season on a high than to start on a high? For sure, this was our aim, to show a good result, and we're really proud that we can drive with a Czech, who is such a nice brand, and uh, it's an own-built car, so for us it, it was now nice to show. We, we know the potential is there, and now we're so proud that we could show it at the race and win this race. This is great, and thanks to Czech, we're great. Well, I think there are many very popular results here this afternoon, but I think your one gets the prize. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I just didn't follow the question. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying everybody's so happy. Yeah. You get the prize for being the happiest team. Absolutely. I Thing, but the team is over there. I mean, they've done a great job. We just drove a perfect car, so it's easy to finish in front. There are the guys, he and the whole crew behind there. Enjoy it, celebrate it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the Emil Frey Jaguar team does celebrate, doesn't it? Knows how to throw a party. So, lots and lots of uh, happy people in Park Ferme and resigned people at Bentley. Let's hear from them. John has found the Bentley boys. So do you. Guy, Guy, great drive by Bentley, second place when you were the starting, lights flashing everywhere, Andy, you were under pressure and you were providing pressure, Stephen, you lived up to my view of being a little terrier, snapping at the legs, got penalised, start off with you Guy, how was it at the beginning? Yeah, it was good, I mean, um, it, typically the start's very difficult here, a lot of cars going down into uh, turn one is very tight, um, a little bit exciting, but um, the main thing was to get through there without... Uh, any contact and uh, the first stint went well we managed to move forward and uh, Andy drove a great stint and then was over to Stephen at the end and uh, yeah it was just uh, exciting as always. But you had the middle stint Andy and of course the team were saying let the other Bentley go maybe it's a bit quicker I mean you don't, nobody likes to be asked to, let, to give ground. Well no but he was on new tyres and um, and we were on a, we were on a different strategy we put new tyres on at the end so um, yeah. yeah no it was a good battle to be fair we were we were quick so these guys did an absolutely incredible job as usual so um, yeah it was just very tight at the end certainly was Stephen you fought very hard with the Nissan you got ahead there was light contact and sort of we thought maybe it didn't have any bearing, but you then had to give up that place and do the job a second time. Yeah, it was um, it was enjoyable. Well, it was enjoyable to a point, but um, I just have to thank the team. Um, M uh, Bentley M Sport done a fantastic job all year. These two guys drove amazingly to give me the car in a good good position, and uh, 
Yeah, it was it was difficult against Alex. He had a lot of straight line speed, and um, you know it was. I thought the first pass was quite fair, but <laughs> we had to do it again, and we got past and we got second. But um, it's just a shame we we couldn't have got past them earlier and got up to the McLaren. Do you think you could have chased the McLaren down? Um, yeah, I think I think if we'd have had clear air, probably it would have been a better fight. The trouble is that thing was boiling like a kettle when it came in. How far would it go? Oh, it would have went. It would have went all day. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> They're building strong and crazy. <laughs> they certainly do. Anyway, congratulations. Great drive. Memorable 1929 and all that number on the 31 car. Well done. See you next year. Thank you. And so the drivers shortly will be making their way to the podium. Some of the drivers are already there. We have, of course, the class champions podium, I suspect, to look forward to as well. But let's have a look, first of all, at how the overall results were. Race results, first of all. 88 laps done. And it was a win for the... Shane Van Gisbergen, Rob Bell, Kevin S. McLaren, ahead of the Bentley of Guy Smith, Andy Merrick and Stephen Kane, and the Pro Cup champions, Getsu Masaccio, Wolfgang Reip, and Alex Buncombe. Fourth was Audi number one, ahead of the second Bentley. Lamborghini's best was sixth in the end, ahead of the Santaloc Audi, the Dolby Plowman, Walkinshaw Nissan eighth. That Falcons Mercedes was ninth and faded a bit, and the Motorbase Aston Martin we hardly saw, but Rory Butcher brought it home in tenth position. In Pro-Am, 17th overall was Gabriele Gardel, second Cedric Spriazzioli and Adrian Delina, they're under investigation. And third was the Michael Lyons, Bromniewski, Alessandro Bonaccini, Ferrari, that finished in 19th place overall. And then go down yet further and you find the winning car in the Am category. And that down in 35th place was the Anthony Pons, Fabian Bartes, Ferrari, second in the Am category was the Carimoje Oliver Grutz at BMW. And then in 37th place overall on the next page, you get to the Porsche that Frank Schmickler brought home, that they were all ahead of the Julian Westwood Ian Loggy at Audi. And that came home in fifth place. So with the Porsche bagging third and the Audi fifth, the Audi the champion by just one point in the championship. Couldn't be much closer, but in 43rd place overall, 5th in class, Ian Loggie and Julian Westwood, class champions by a solitary point. And the rest of the finishers, you see, 55 started the race, and the bulk did make it to the end. But there you start to see those that did have problems and the many, many laps down that didn't get to the finish, 49th and back. The damaged Mercedes, the Ferrari that was in the gravel a couple of times, more errant Ferraris, and the very damaged Bentley damaged Nissan and a broken Ferrari as well out of the race. The Pro Cup Ferrari never really came good on the promise it showed in qualifying. So that's the race result and now the drivers get themselves ready for the podium ceremony where in a moment they will be called forward and the SRO officials making sure they have all the drivers across the three classes. And the intention will be to do the uh, AM podium first. So that means that we have Jürgen Herring, Dimitris Konstantinou and Frank Schmickler onto the podium first. For second place in Pro-Am, Karim Moje and Oliver Grutz recovering from the accident that the car had at Spa. But a maiden victory in the AM competition goes the way of Anthony Pons and Fabian Bartes, who make their way to the top step of the podium. It is a win for the Acker ASP, the Acker Autosport Promotion team, and the Ferrari drivers can celebrate. The AM Cup winners, Anthony Pons and Fabian Bartes for ACA ASP, Jérôme Polycon's team. And now the trophy is presented, first of all, to the third place team of Frank Schmickler, Dimitris Constantinou and Jürgen Herring, the Porsche drivers on the podium. Second place will go to Carrie Roger and Oliver Grutz. 
And then to the race winners, another first time victor is the combination of Fabian Bartes and Anthony Pons. And in the middle, Jerome Polycon, who very successful racer himself, now runs the team. It's the first time that they have scored a victory. The Porsche team on the podium for the second time this year. And a third podium result for Oliver Grutz and Karim Auger. The AM Cup winners, Anthony Pons and Fabian Bartes. And so now, is there champagne for them, they ask? The podium is next going to have the presence of Stefan Rattel, the chairman and CEO of the Stefan Rattel organization, who hands over money to the teams, 5,000 euros to the winners of the AM Cup. Then there I think, will be some more checks to be given across the podium ceremonies. So the drivers can now celebrate their victory. And I can hear bottles chinking in the background as the trophies have been presented. Now the champagne is brought forward. The Porsche drivers at one end of the podium. And there is a plan here as to when it can be presented. I think trophies have to be put down, first of all. Karim Ojo says, what would we do now? Now the trophies are all on the floor pretty much. The champagne can be handed over to drivers, and some with bottle, others not. And Karim Ojo says, no, thank you very much, I'm off. Uh, in fact, nobody is in terribly much of a spraying mood, are they? So Jerome Polycon, as the winning team manager, thinks otherwise. Fabian Bartes makes his way off the podium. Prolific racer these days, but for his team, Jerome Polycon sprays the champagne. So a first uh, victory in the AM Cup for Anthony Pons and Fabian Bartes, but Ian Loggy and Julian Westwood, the champions by just one point in the end from Jürgen Herring, Dimitris Constantino and Frank Schmickler. Steve Earle and Liam Talbot and Marco Zanettini end up third after a pretty subdued race by their standards, it must be said. Fourth, not here this weekend, Andre Berzin, Fabio Mancini and Rino Mastronardi. Um, but for the accident at Spa, Oliver Grutz and Karim Oje would have been more of a threat in the championship, taking uh, fifth in the end. Fabian Bartes and Anthony Pons at sixth at the end of the season. So the drivers now being brought forward for uh, Pro-Am, which means that, first of all, out come Michael Lyons, Michael Brodnieski and Alessandro Bonaccini for second place onto the podium, Cedric Spiazzioli and Adrian Delina. And then the joyous Emil Frey Jaguar team, Lawrence Frey, along with Freddie Bath and former FIA GT champion Gabriele Gardel for the top step and the team represented as well. Pro-Am win for the first time for the Emil Frey Jaguar, for Gabrielli Gardel, Lawrence Frey and Freddy Bath. The victors on the top step of the podium, the trophies now presented and a tremendous result for the Jaguar team after so many years of trying. It's come good at long, long last. Freddy Bath saying to John Watson, we just drove a perfect car, but it's taken a long time to get anything like a perfect car, but today it has happened. And I don't think anybody will begrudge the team its day in the sun. No, they uh, thoroughly delighted, and I think, as I said, on the uh, done on the Park Ferme, probably amongst many, many very popular outcomes to the various championships, categories, and whatever, that this car, this team, have persevered. And for four years, they've been working to make this Jaguar XKS become a competitive, reliable race car, and today that came to fruition. And it's always this: is it better to do it at the end of the season, yeah. finish on a high, than it is to start well then taper away? and the pleasure and the joy, and I'm sure that that team will know how to celebrate. They look like they're players, and they certainly are going to behave like it up on the podium. Hey, Gabriele Gardel, go back over a decade, he was the man to beat in Ferraris in FIA GT, but he's had many years in the wilderness, really, almost forgotten about after the Ferrari project stopped, and he's been racing in the Trofeo Maserati and in this, but 
you kind of forget that he was very, very successful all those years ago, but he's proved, if you needed a reminding, that he hasn't lost his ability to drive. And they're looking down from the podium at the winning overall cars in the Park Ferme area. So let's double check the points in Pro Am. It was already won, of course, by Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffin. Second in the championship goes the way of Alessandro Bonaccini, Michael Brosniewski and Michael Lyons ahead of Francisco Guedes. Then Stuart Leonard and Michael Meadows ahead in turn of Marco Asma and Alexei Vasiliev with some of the absent drivers, Jimmy Bruni, Pasin Lafouras next in the standings. Much of that based on how people did at Spa, of course, with those triple opportunities to score points. And AF Corsa, the winning team, Kessel Racing second and Leonard Motorsport in third, the Aston Martin team. Emil Frey racing fourth ahead of GT Russian team and then Rinaldi sixth from Black Falcon, Ikuria Kos and the second of the Nissan GT Academy team, RJN cars outscoring Team Russia by Barwell with Demon Tweaks. That's the top ten in Pro-Am and the drivers have now made their way off the podium which means that we await the arrival of the victors in the Pro Cup. And so as the podium is made ready out comes the new pro cup champion but for third in the race the team of captain masaccio alex bunker and wolfgang reich third in the race but pro cup champions then second in the race and second in the championship stephen kane guy smith and andy merrick for the m sport bentley team but the winners for the second time this year the only double winners in the championship this year shane van gisberg and rob bell and kevin est for von ryan racing So the trophy is brought forward for the third place drivers, first of all, a very emotional Alex Buncombe when uh, John talked to him in Park Ferme, Wolfgang Reip, now able to breathe again, Katsumasa Chio, who stood nervously, I don't think he moved a muscle, did he? Certainly didn't stray away from where he was standing in that last hour of the race. The trophies to the Bentley boys for second place, Andy Merrick, Stephen Kane and Guy Smith. No wins this year, but blimey, they threw everything at that last race, and then how McLaren has moved on, how Von Rahn Racing has moved on this year. Double winners, not a single Audi victory in Pro Cup, but McLaren has become a, man, a, a brand with two wins. And Shane Van Gisbergen, the bearded Kiwi, along with Kevin Est and Rob Bell, celebrate. There is a 15,000 euro check to go to the team as well from Le Patron, from Stefan Rattel. That might go in beer tonight to celebrate a great result. And so the three race class podiums completed and we anticipate that the champions will be recognized on the podium as well but first of all there are the bottles of champagne which have been saved thus far largely but i don't think that's going to be the case here captain masaccio says we are out to spray this aren't we and alex buncombe agrees so the pro cup drivers celebrate in style a win in Pro Cup for Shane Van Gisbergen, Rob Bell and Kevin Est. <laughs> Champagne everywhere and three different stories. A race winner, a champion and the vanquished, both in the race and in the title race. Two seconds, if you like, out of that for the Bentley drivers. Second in the race, second in the championship, but it certainly wasn't for the want of trying because they threw everything at it as we check the points at the end of the Pro Cup. Alex Buncombe, Ketsu Masaccio and Wolfgang Wright victorious in the end by three points over Stephen Kane, Andy Merrick and Guy Smith. Stefan Ortelli and Frank Stippel are almost anonymous in that race. And Rob Bell, Kevin Est and Shane Van Gisbergen in the end fourth. Just think what it might have been but for Paul Ricard and but for Spa. Lucas Law absent this weekend, the Spa 24 hours winner taking fifth along with co-drivers from that event in Marcus Paltola and then behind the likes of Jean-Carl Vernet, Robin Frins and Lawrence Van Tour having struggled to make points over the course of the season. They end up 
seventh in the case of Van Tor and Frins and Verne. Behind uh, Nico Bastien and Steph Dusseldorp, Danny Junkide in ninth, Nico Muller tenth, Maxime Martin eleventh, Buk, Suchek and Sule twelfth in the second uh, of the Bentleys after a more difficult season again for the second car. But so many point scorers within Pro Cup this year. Nick Katzberg, of course, part of the winning team at Spa. Babini, Mull, Palmer, winners at Monza. And all of that means that as far as the teams are concerned, then the points scored give, in the end, a three-point win to the Belgian Audi Club Team WRT. So no race wins, no drivers celebrations, but a team's championship instead, ahead of the M Sport Bentley squad in second place. And then the champions, because the AM champions, Ian Loggy and Julian Westwood, class winners here last year, step forward. The Pro-AM winners, Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffin, will step forward. And then we will have the Pro Cup winners as well, because there's going to be another enormous cheer reserved for Alex Buncan, Katsumasa Chio and Wolfgang Reip, who make their way out onto the podium. And in a championship as competitive as this, John, to win, never mind your class in the race, but in the championship itself takes a huge amount of effort and commitment. Well, it's also done over such a variety of races, three hours, six hours, the 24, the <laughs> exhausting 24 hours of Spa. Uh, not only are the cars exhausted, but it, it's, it's a very diverse championship. Yeah. It is an endurance race, but this today was a sprint three-hour race. There was no breathing space for any one of those nine team members from the three categories at all and it was just a flat out charge so the class winners being joined by of course the representatives and i think anybody who wants to get on the podium now is going to join in so <laughs> it's going to be a very very long photograph this to be orchestrated but the three class champions and remember matt griffin and duncan cameron wrapped it up at spa and now the celebrations begin ian loggy and julian westwood for stuart parker's team Team Parker Racing winning the AM class by just a point, but a win's a win. Yeah, and I think it's a great story, just two drivers mm. in normal circumstances, three, of course, at Spa. Julian Westwood, a driver who was a young up-and-coming driver in the 80s, then sort of got rather lost in the usual issue about funding and went off and did other things in his life, now coming back and having the time of his life and winning championships. Um, Ian Loggy, somebody who, having built a successful business, has come into racing in the last few years. <laughs> and Katsu Masagio with a selfie stick, yep. ready to take photos. Somebody had to do, someone had to do it. <laughs> so, it uh, never used to be like that, did it? Selfie sticks, what were they? So, there you go. The class champions at the end of another fantastic season in the Blanc Pain Endurance Series. The drivers make their way away from the podium, Ketsamasa Chio celebrating along with his Pro Cup teammate champions, Alex Buncombe and Wolfgang Reip. So they make their way from the podium away to the press conference, but the winning drivers celebrate at the end of what has been another fantastic round of the championship from OJ Borg, John Watson and David Addison. Thanks for your company. It's been a great way to end the season. There'll be more of the same in 2016. Let's look back at the highlights of the final round of the Blanc Pain Endurance Series that began with a three-way battle for leadership going down towards the first turn and contact between Bentley and McLaren. As the battles continued around the opening lap of the race, it was clear that those that were having to make some progress up through the order were going to find it difficult. An early safety car was brought about by Gary Kondakov, who went off the road into the gravel, and then there was more drama as Nico Bastian made contact with Alvaro Perenz McLaren. Up front, Craig Dolby was storming clear. In second place, Adrian Zhao defending well from Katsu Masaccio, but that meant in turn that they were losing ground against the race leader. Trying to make progress in number one was Jean-Carl Verne, but he was dropping back to the frustration of Vincent Voss and Pierre Giudone. A big accident in the second part of the race brought out another safety car, went off the road with a bit of help, went the Bentley in the hands of Harold Prima, who was set to have his last ever race anyway, but sadly it didn't turn out to be the farewell he wanted. The safety car eventually caught the race leader, others pitted, and then on the restart there was a bit of contact as Lawrence Vantor just touched the back of the 63 Lamborghini and then had to give back the place. More contact as Stefan Ortelli was glanced by the 173 Nissan of Martin Plowman. Both continued, both delayed.
The battle, though, between the Nissan of Alex Buncombe and the Bentley of Guy Smith took up attention for the last hour of the race, effectively. There was this little nudge that sent the Bentley Nissan ever so slightly wide. Stephen Kane levelled at the next corner, and what the Bentley team thought was a great move was not agreed with by the race officials, and they told Kane to give back the place. He had to do it all over again, but do it he did, and this time it was down at turn one. Up the inside went the Bentley. Place gained, job done. Kane then set off in pursuit of the race leading McLaren, but with some clever pit stop strategy, had assumed the lead in the hands of Kevin Est. But then Alex Buncombe had to fight, fight, fight to keep at bay the number one Audi that had crept into the picture. Katsumasa Chio studied the points permutations as the number 58 McLaren came through to score a second win of the season, the only car to win twice in 2015. A win for the Von Rahn Racing McLaren in the hands of Kevin S, Rob Bell and Shane Van Gisbergen to bring down the curtain on another all-action race in an all-action season in the Blancpain Endurance Series. Third on the track was enough to give Pro Cup Championship honours, though, to Alex Buncombe, Wolfgang Reip and Ketsomasa Chio for Bob Neville's Team RJN squad. Another tremendous race in the Blancpain Endurance Series. Next year can't come soon enough. Bye for now. Oh, no.